Mufasa ke Mufasa. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking in Stations, the news show about EVE Online. I am Matterall, the TMC News Chief. And um, we have a big show packed with a lot of people, a lot of opinions, um, with really great insight. So stay tuned for a great two hours of talking about EVE Online and all the stuff that's happening. Uh, let's get through introductions real quick, starting with Tiberius. Hey there, I'm uh, Tiberius Stargazer. I am the Editor-in-Chief of EVE NT. Um, I'm also an editor and writer for EVE News 24. And um, tonight I am drinking pony. This is a non-drinking show, but go ahead. Uh, we'll let you have that one swig and then put it, <laughs> put your hands on your lap. Uh, Ashtarathi, how are you? Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ashtarathi, the space bard. I can finally say that. At least soon I'll be able to say that. Wanna and be. Uh, I am a writer for Crossing Zebras, a uh, podcaster on more things than I care to list at the moment, including now on grid. So, uh, yeah. Dirk. Hey, what's up? It's uh, Dirk McGurk, a uh, member of Sniggardly and Pandemic Legion, uh, also a host of the Open Comms show on Matani.com. Yeah, and as guests today, we have, uh, let's start with Carneros. Hello, uh, my name is Carneros. I'm the CEO of The Bastion, a Nelsec Sov Alliance. I'm also a former uh, sales and marketing director for CCP, where I used to go by the name CCP Zinfandel. Uh, for my day job right now, I'm a senior producer on EverQuest, EverQuest 2, and a couple of unannounced products from Daybreak Games. Yeah, it's awesome. Amazing credentials for what we're going to talk about Thank later. Uh, and from the CSM and representatives of the players to CCP, we have Sullen. How's it going? Yep, Sullen Decimus here. Um, currently in uh, Polaris Rising Corp in the Bastion, so I got my wonderful CEO right there above me in the stream. And uh, along with, as you mentioned, CSM11, um, looking forward to going out to the summit, which we are leaving on next week. Oh, that's funny. It's kind of like the Brady Bunch. Huh? It would be funny if you could break the screen, like go up there and put your hand on his shoulder. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, and off screen today we have, um, really uh, thankful to have, uh, let's start with Elise Randolph. Hey everyone, I'm Elise Randolph. I'm an FC in Pandemic Legion and uh, kind of all around Eve nerd, I think is a, a pretty good title. Yeah, yeah, you always undersell yourself though. I think it's part of your charm, but uh, yeah, head of Pandemic Legion, but also you've been an advocate for free to play uh, for a little while. At least you were out there talking about it before other people were. And, uh, and we'll even talk about the name free to play uh, later on. Um, but let's finish introducing people and we'll go to No Easy Gamer. Hello, everybody. I'm Nosy Gamer. Um, I write a blog called The Nosy Gamer, and I am, I think, the token care bearer for this panel. Uh, I don't know. I, I would give you a run for your money, and uh, Urziel there too. Let's uh, say hi to Urziel99. I'm Urziel99, a member of Multiplex Gaming, part of the Bastion, and I'm pretty much the token industrialist for the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome all right lots to talk about um i think we got everybody and uh, this is probably one of the largest shows we've had but um all these voices are going to be really interesting for this uh, round of topics but the first thing we're going to do is talk about uh we haven't had a show uh until the day before s1 uh sorry sh1 happened which is a battle uh where uh, pl and nc dot kind of hammered down uh, CO2 and test, uh, brought in, and test, basically, they brought in uh, uh, dread. Um, so we don't have to go through all the news again, like, uh, like uh, you know, to tell you what happened, but what was significant about that fight? First of all, who was in it? That was I was in there. That fight. I was totally there. It was great. I got told that uh, it was probably it had the potential to be the next BTAC R, and that I should just make sure I'm there to to witness where all the alliance money was going to end up going. So I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'll show up, I'll fly around, do some stuff. I mostly just flew a dictor and kind of kind of watched what was going on and had had some fun. Let some uh, let the other great FCs like figure out how to how to wage war and whatnot. <laughs> 
Yeah, Tiberius was with me at NC Dot, and uh, and Dirk, you were there for PS. Yep, yep, yep. Just flying around in my A hack. Yeah, so okay, so what happened there basically was these these uh, there was an escalation of titans. I, I should actually should let uh, at least talk about the stuff. He's the most experienced combat person on the show. But um, let me just get through it real quick. There was a big fight. There was a lot of supers that were used unexpectedly, maybe, and CO two lost a few, but they also saved a bunch. And uh, how do you see that as far as like that? Uh, is has there been a change in combat because that kind of a fight? B Tech R was that kind of a fight. Nothing escaped. Everything got destroyed, and it was just a matter of time before everything got destroyed. But they actually managed to get out in this fight. They managed to get, you know, Titans out. Uh, well, I think the scale is incredibly different, and, and the entire the entire capital and super capital meta has drastically changed. So uh, the ones that managed to escape, it's a lot of it has to do with uh, the scale of the fight and the fact of how dictators work and, and things like that. Uh, in Tech R. It was mostly just a capital slugfest. Like uh, there were some very small super capital forces, but uh, back then the the meta was just bring as many carriers, dreads, supers, and titans as you could. Um, now the meta has shifted where super capitals are incredibly vulnerable by themselves. Right? They need a support wing, and uh, in a sense, this was always true, but it is much, much more true ever since the the capital rebalance. Yeah, totally. So you can, in fact, save some uh, some caps though. I will say it was. I think it's the bloodiest capital fight that's happened since the capital change. So it was a. Uh, it, was, it was. It was pretty grim. It was the high water mark for um, post capital change as well. So I'm gonna ask the the dumb question, being the guy that has no idea what's going on in those kinds of fights. Um, what? How did the the Titan Doomsday change? Because didn't they add a new? To the doomsday and wasn't that to prevent this kind of just escalation straight to doomsdays or at least make it have to be way more spread out but yet the in the images i didn't see that so did that have any impact how did that play out and then what about um the new doomsdays did those factor in at all uh some people did uh, a few of their there i think there were a few lances and uh scythes and whatnot but uh, a lot of the the doomsday were a lot of the targeted ones to, to clear through a lot of the dread DPS, right? The, in capital fights, although capitals have changed quite a bit, uh, the biggest threat is always going to be dreadnoughts, right? They, they are sort of the glass cannon of the capital group. So you just want to eliminate those as fast as you can. And Tess brought in a bunch of, I believe what they wanted to do was bring in sniper dreads, but they brought in like sniper dreads that were a little bit too close. <laughs> so they ended <laughs> up uh, dying really, really quickly and not accomplishing their goal. Uh, sniper dreads, of course, is a tactic that um, Eve pilots used almost 10 years ago, 8, 10 years ago, when super capitals and titans didn't really have a role in, in capital warfare. Uh, it was a matter of whoever came in last with the sniper dreads always won because they would be the sniper dreads plucking away at the ships, ships that couldn't even reach them and they were stuck in space for, for seemingly forever. Um, but in, to your point about the uh, doomsday mechanic, uh, that has changed a lot about how much organization and how much effort is required. So in that fleet, there were probably six or seven FCs on PL side alone that were coordinating which doomsday would go where, how to react to the doomsdays, how to react to the new drain, and stuff like that. Yeah. How was their accuracy, the doomsday? Uh, so in high tie-dye fights, super capital and capital, or capital and or titan and super capital combat, the interface is um, incredibly buggy. <laughs> As it turns <laughs> no out, kidding. it's uh, very hard to do. <laughs> like Things always break their lock. Uh, nothing's to work right. So uh, for, for the super capital, it was a bit of a struggle, right? So uh, trying to get things worked out. And of course, afterwards, we saw that there was a mass test on Sissy like a week later where they addressed or where they were trying to gather information about a lot of these bugs in order to fix them. Um, and I believe Larrikin made a post saying like they understand that this is what happened and they're trying to figure out what exactly happened so they can fix it. And I know a lot of people on, uh, I think it was the same day that like there was a big WoW expansion that came out too. So a lot of people stopped playing WoW so they could go on the test server and mess with capitals. <laughs> <laughs> as, a little, as a little side note from that uh, test they did, um, they were killing a Citadel, I think it was, and um, CCP Larrikin typed to the local, put your shades on, the big bang's about to happen, but the Citadel didn't explode. And so, oh, I better take a note of that. And one of the ISDs piped up said, Citadel needs more boom. 
Sit it out there. Yeah, it's quite funny. I like the idea of uh, the WoW players looking around saying, where'd everybody go? Oh, All the mean people Eve. left. Yeah, exactly. All the trucks <laughs> are gone for like two hours. What happened? Yeah, so, so nice. The butterflies are out again. The uh, barons are empty. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, so those were the lessons from SH1. Anyone else have anything to say about that? No, I mean, it, it, it was an enjoyable fight. I mean, I, you know, I was in, again, the PL subcap group. Um, and it, it's funny because you're hearing what's going on in your comms, right? You're hearing some stuff that gets relayed, you know, some of what was going on with capitals and things like that. But when you go back and you listen to kind of um, other people who were in either other fleets or, you know, whatever, you know, describe it. I swear it all went down much quicker than the way I was hearing it described in some, you know, in some other places out there. Um, mm. you know, I mean, the tie, yeah, the tie dye was the tie dye, right? I mean, a lot of us have gotten used to how you, you know, how you act with that. What I have heard from the, you know, from the, from the Titan side of things, you know, was that that lag and the multiple steps that go into firing some of those doomsdays is really, you know, what caused some inaccuracies out there. Um, it, you know, it, it was good to see, uh, it was good to see CO2, you know, dropping what it was they did. Um, no, yeah. I mean, I, I gotta admit, I was, it's like, I was kind of thinking nothing much would happen, that nobody really, cause just kind of get used to the fact that nobody would drop anything. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, CO2 have dropped super caps. I'm like, what? It, it, it kind of <laughs> felt like Christmas, right? Yeah, it felt like Christmas. Are they super serious? Oh my God. So, it was very so uh, bizarre, like, and I think like CO2 deserves a lot of credit, which it, it's very hard to, to understand what I mean when I say like giving the losing side a lot of credit. A lot of EVE players and a lot of EVE groups would have just been like, oh, this is uh, too much for us to fight. We're not even going to try, right? And the fact that CO2, and CO2 has habitually done this, right? They've always had some sort of moxie behind them, some sort of, you know what, I don't care if we win or lose. We have a lot of money. Like, who cares if we lose, if we can replace everything? Let's just go out and try it. So... When they logged in their supers and unlocked dreads, we were like, it's weird that they're doing this. We have 80 titans on field or ready to sign one on field. I'd be surprised if they do. And as soon as, like, before I could even finish that sentence, they had signed in with their supers. And Test had begun dropping in dreads. Test didn't bring their supers because I guess they weren't in range or whatever. But um, mm. still, I, I think it was, I think CO2 deserves a lot of credit for having the, uh, the mocks to try and pull that off. Well, did you think that they actually... It's unthinkable. Did you think they maybe didn't see the NC supers coming in? Supposedly, they did not see NC dot, or they did not foresee NC dot bringing supers. But NC dot literally had moved their supers <laughs> like an hour before yeah. the engage. Right? Was... Like, it was hard and, to and, miss. And we had like an entire fleet of supers moving afterwards to catch up as well. Um, yeah, there was which is just crazy. two two waves. Yeah, yeah. But but okay. Uh, but so was, that was. I... I have it wasn't an isolated incident. I would say that they, they were just completely caught off guard. But this is something CO2 has done before. That they always been like, you know what, we can well, let's try and give this uh, fight a fight. Especially Gig X, uh, the CO2 FC. Is like he's always been known for for as long as I've played even and, and been aware of him. He's always been known for trying these like crazy moves, high risk, uh, high reward moves. No lack of moxie. Mm. But the funny thing is, is like the gamble was that close to paying off because I, I remember moving my super in, running it as fast as I possibly could to get within jump range. And one of my court mates were going, in the, sitting in there in that Titan on field going, I think I might die. I'm like, what? And for the first time ever, I, I could ir unironically say that we're jumping the cavalry in. So it nearly paid off. They nearly killed the Titan. There were a couple. There were a couple interesting things because having been, you know, having been in VTAC R and then this, right? One of the things that was surprising was when those supers started to get away. It's like when you're when you've been in those big fights before, they don't seem to get away like that. And and one of the things mm -hmm. that I, I don't think Elise mentioned, um, but but the effect of being able to to you know micro jump bubbles away um, was was vastly different than previous capital fights. Yeah, they got the entire super play out, like the whole thing. So I have a follow-up question for the Doomsday question, because Elise said that it was a lot more coordination, but obviously you were able to do it. So obviously this was done, you know, for several reasons, but I think that one of the stated reasons for a lot of the capital changes was to make the capital experience kind of more engaging and more active and whatnot. Do you feel that a Titan fight is better now or than it was prior to the changes? Do you feel that those 
modifications, those those extra hindrances that you have to work around, did you find that a, a, a fun puzzle to solve, or did you find that just another nuisance? Uh, I'd say that PL, uh, coming from PL, and PL is a bit strange when it comes to these sort of things, uh, they, PL loves challenges and figuring out the new way to do something the best, right? And if you look at the, the fights from different perspectives, uh, the perspective, of course, because after the fight, there's lots of videos up there, and they were, it's always kind of really cool to see. But you can see, like, the decision-making and the fits, even, from the CO2 side were kind of stale and old. You can see that they hadn't really done too much uh, consideration in, in how this would change. And the PL side was the complete opposite. Um, the PLFCs, and especially Doom Chinchilla, was trying up new, uh, took a bunch of new theory crafting for new tactics and how to effectively do this and how to uh, how to get the most out of everything. So normally I, I'd say not a big deal. For PL, we love a challenge and, and love trying to figure something out. There's like a, a bit of courage when we like figure out the best way to do it first. So we can just like be really, it seems like we're way better than we are just because we know the mechanics are more, are more familiar with the mechanics. And so we've so had did... that like two months of coasting when people don't really know what's up. So if you were really practiced with the doomsdays, did did anybody see or was there mistakes on the other side? Were there misfires or uh, people tripping up on it? Yeah, I, I think the uh, the CO2 side, especially, well, obviously the CO2 side had uh, a lot of mistakes and a lot of just um, tactical decisions that that weren't that weren't uh, up to the meta, right? They, they they weren't current, like up to date and current. It doesn't mean that they were bad in a sense, or they had bad FCs. They just you could tell that there was a, a bit of lag there, a bit of a uh, a separation between the new mechanics and how the old mechanics used to work, right? So they're trying mm. to, to fit the square peg in the round hole a little bit too much, where PL just had the, the square peg and just fired it over and over well, and over again. So that, that seems to be the difference, too, that was another lesson coming out of that was that some people have adapted to the meta quicker than others. And you could tell by their fits that they weren't synergized to work together. You could tell by the way they dropped in that something went wrong or they weren't synergized to work together. But the point was some groups have adapted quicker than others. And these are major changes, and they're going to take a long time to, to shake out. But you can already see some people are ahead of others as far as adapting to the changes. And, and I want to point out that that's not an insult to either side or any side at this point. These changes are mm. brand new and everybody is still wrestling with it. As you pointed out, this is the big, this is the first yeah, totally. time that it, this is the first live fire, right? So yeah, if PL, they're also hard to test, right? You can't just bring out Titans and test them, uh, right. not in a real way. You can test them on the server, a test server, but in a safe way. But when you're in, when the stakes are high, you're not going to like practice this kind of, but at the same time, like if, if PL drilled on it as much as they did, or as much as it sounds like they did, then uh, of mm. course they're going to just be a little bit more kind of honed in because it's new. They've they've but they've already digested it while other people might be a little bit further well, behind. Well, that's in that's an advantage though that, that hasn't been talked about, and that is that PL can practice more because they fear less. Uh, people jumping on them. They can out-escalate anybody with the help of NC dot. So it's a little safer for them to practice than it would be for a CO2 to practice or a test or anybody like that. Oh, that's a good point because they, they can transition from singularity testing to tranquility testing sooner because they have more other protections. Field and testing. a lot of it has to do with um, the, the, the way PL operates is like we realize that we're nothing if, if we don't understand the game better. Like we're not the biggest alliance. Uh, we have a bunch of supers, but we don't have the most supers and stuff like that. So what we did, and, and this was Doom Chinchilla's idea again, like we ever we have a channel called SC Legion, which is like the, the channel for all the super captain titan pilots. Uh, when the capital changes happened, we kicked everyone out of that channel. The only way you could get back into the channel is to prove that you have an understanding of the mechanics. Right? It's not just have the ship; you have to understand the mechanics. The mm. only way that you can join the fleet is if you've been in that channel. And so you're not a liability. So everyone in that channel knows the mechanic inside and out. Did you let in girls? <laughs> girls are in fact allowed. But you know what? Like, I have some theories on that. But that's my point. Like, that's a level of dedication that not every, not necessarily everybody was into, but it paid off as well it should have, right? Like, like the people who trained were were ahead on that one, and that's not an insult to anybody else. It's just a matter of, you know. That's what training well, does. I mean, right, well, last point, then we'll end, move. On. Yeah, I mean, even on, on, on my end, um, I get to play around with my super on a regular basis, and in that fight, I was sitting there sweating, just trying to concentrate on what I'm do 
doing with my fighters and things like that because there's never there hasn't been a situation yet where I was tested in that field of battle. And you know, I was making mistakes and going, what am I doing? What am I doing? Because I'm flying around with four four fighters, three, four wings, whatever, um, worth like a couple of hundred mil each. <laughs> so I was sweating in that one. Hmm. But it was good. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Keep Stars. So a few days later, there's this huge fight uh, in SH1. And then a few days later, as people are talking about that fight, uh, a Keep Star goes up. Um, actually, it was put up during the fight, if I'm not mistaken, because the very next day, 24 hours later, it came out of reinforce and became vulnerable. And at that time, uh, it was it was actually in, uh, anchored by uh, Project Mayhem. And so at that time, in came PL and CDOT and Wow, just a lot of people in in you know, just after downtime, which is a really odd hour to have that many people on at the same time. Uh, and they took out that Keepstar. They destroyed. Yeah, that was a so. A lot of it has to do with like that's probably the first Keepstar that was vulnerable in any sense of the word, right? The very first one was put up by Heart Docs in wormhole space. You just like you there are no there is no way for you to get that like get that down you can't even meet the damage cap unless you've been preparing it for a long time mm. and then the um the next one was anchored in myla by uh, a bunch of people by care for kids and it was guarded by people that they paid to, to guard it right mercenaries test was there pl was there nc dot was there and they were all blue to one another so you couldn't even amass a force to take that down um this project mayhem one was the first that was like project mayhem didn't really have um the political backing to secure it online, they decided to go through it through military reasons and or, or through military means, and also by uh, through a matter of kind of I don't want to say abusing, but uh, by using a really off time for everyone else. Right? It's a good time for time zone for them and a bad time zone for everyone else. And the fact that the the Keepstar could uh, kind of have a little bit of time during downtime and that uh, that interruption are, between the two is, is kind of are they uh, russian or australian are they russian or australian like why would that be a good time zone for them uh well, they're i think they're mostly russian core if i'm, if I'm not wrong but if i'm not yes, mistaken yeah, yeah, yeah. from from my understanding the choices that were made were mostly to attempt to leverage the issues of tie-dye versus the timer versus uh like downtime yeah, that the, the whole point was to try and figure out a way to make it so with a, a nice interruption at downtime and a really awkward time for it online that there wouldn't be a big enough force to, to threaten it. On um, a unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, the the glitz and glam of being able to kill say you kill the first Keep Star overcame a lot of that. Uh, everyone well, the, wants to be the first. There was also a hope that was going around, or a, almost a fear, really, that as they piled in more and more people like they invited everybody to come basically because they wanted tie-dye to take over to such a point that people could not bring in enough of the bigger ships it would take to hit the dps uh, minimum uh, that was one of the theories that was kind of going into it whether or not they would even be able because the problem is is that the the amount of damage that you have to do uh per second scales very very high during time tie-dye because uh the per second changes right um the time stretches but the 15 minute timer doesn't so um any rate or the 20 second rolling timer doesn't rather for for That's calculation right, yeah. of dps yeah. so you're really doing less damage because you're working one tenth the speed it's like a, a, a one tenth haste debuff on everybody anywho so uh that was one of the hopeful protections for the citadel and one of the biggest questions i don't think anybody thought that they would like mount a military defense i think that they're trying to abuse the mechanics in order to protect themselves well, yeah when, when I, I wouldn't call it abuse up. the mechanic though I and mean, the mechanic is what the mechanic is and yeah uh, it's I mean, dropping stations has always been you know you know in the days of dropping stations right yeah it's always been a thing you did right before downtime yeah that's, that's true that's, that's, that's I, an actual strategy that, that people try and use and and ashrathi pointed out like uh, in time dilation, like everyone's fire is slower, right? But the the timer goes down in real time, so you have to do essentially six times more effort. Um, mm -hmm. And in the beginning, it seemed like uh, the Project Mayhem strategy was to just use the fact that they have um, they're very strong in this very time in this certain time zone, right? And then when the, the writing on the wall came down that uh, like 
everyone in EVE was going to try and be there in Nalhula to, to watch this thing go down or to contribute in some way. Like I know Spectre Fleet even did some stuff and there's some other ASI stuff and Goons came down all the way from Delve or came up all the way from Delve. But as soon as that writing was on the wall, um, what their strategy ended up being was let's try and make as much time, uh, time dilation as possible. So you saw them put in a bunch of shuttles, uh, just anchor a bunch of shuttles so that they could smart bomb them and lag the server out a little bit. You had uh, Blue Ice telling his fleet to dock and undock a bunch of times to create some lag and tie dye, and um, you know try and grind the server to a halt that way. Did, but did you say Blue? I believe it was Blue Ice. That was uh, it was Blue Ice. Yeah. So he's the former so... former former Brave uh, FC, right? Yeah, he used to run the. He actually was in charge of Brave's military wing back in the day. Like he was, he was... Their, their head FC. I was so disappointed. It's funny that Brave <laughs> Brave is now back in the day. <laughs> yeah. But um, time time marches on. Uh, okay, so that's interesting. They try to use. They didn't have the political clout to to secure it by having a lot of allies defend it. So they try to use the mechanics as best they could, uh, and they change strategies. That's very interesting. And there was also a campaign um, to get a lot of people there uh, on Reddit, wasn't there? Yeah, that's that's why people started to theorize that they were doing it intentionally to lag it out was because oh totally it was. It was a thing on Reddit, but I mean, honestly, every Keepstar except for the um, the wormhole one has was on Reddit beforehand because, like, you can't you can't put a Keepstar down and have that be obsect. So you might as well just slap it on the table, right? Yeah. Well, they did. I like that they planted it. You know, twenty four hours before that was SH one. So it was kind of funny they dropped it in the middle of that big fight. I would suppose. Um, but yeah, by the way, there's actually two keep stars now. Uh, the second one belongs to Laser Hawks and uh, Wormhole. Sp but um, mm. let's move on to um, Mercenary Coalition. Actually, put down their own keep star and they put it in the middle of uh, uh, the map, pretty much, right? They put it in uh, Sink Lace uh, in Basgur, um, and they called it Tortuga. Uh, does anybody know the significance of that name for that? Uh, absolutely. It's an homage to uh, one of their campaigns back in the day. And there's actually one of Eve's best videos uh, at the time, especially, was Mercenary Coalition Tortuga. It's on YouTube. You guys should go and check it out. It's mm -hmm. great. But um, it's like... Um, uh, it's also here in this article on TMC, by the way. Uh, <laughs> MC deploys Tortuga Keepstar. I don't mind throwing oh, that in there. You can see the video there. <laughs> but yeah, so Go ahead. Has, Sorry. Like, there's a lot of history behind Mercenary Coalition. There were... Um, when Eve... When like uh, the, the early days of Eve, there was Band of Brothers and Mercenary Coalition. Mercenary Coalition was essentially the military might that made kept Band of Brothers like um, afloat a lot of time. Like Band of Brothers, obviously military might in their own sense, but it was Mercenary Coalition that did a lot of work for them, and so they were huge. And Tortuga was one of their ideas. That's uh, when Mercenary Coalition tried to form the actual Mercenary Coalition, a coalition entirely made of mercenaries. They had an idea to, to have a station. They named it Tortuga, and that's where they'd be based out of. So that was their entire uh, thing. So it, it's kind of neat to see Eve's history kind of coming and going like in waves and stuff like that. Yeah, I thought that was a brilliant name for it, uh, and that's why I wrote about it inside the uh, article. Um, great video. If you, should, if you get a chance to go ahead and check that out. So uh, that leads us to... I lost my page here, but... Uh, Another PL uh, incident that happened where PL actually took out a lot of supers from short. So there was a disagreement inside of um, what we'll call, uh, you call, I know you call them, uh, at least you call them dumpst dumpster uh, cola. Yeah, oh, well. I mean, that name, I came up with a great name for them when they lived in the Gulf and, and dumpster cola <laughs> was the acronym for it. <laughs> okay. Oh, they have a rude name, but yeah. They're okay, so we'll call them. We'll... It's Guardians of the Galaxy. Right, so we'll use that name for them, Guardians of the Galaxies. They had a little bit of a dust-up inside uh, their own uh, coalition, and a few alliances were told to leave. And uh, when they left with their supers, um, PL pounced on them. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so a lot of people were, were crying foul, saying that uh, Sword Dragon, who is the leader of the Guardians of the Galaxy coalition, uh, tipped off PL as to when and where these... Uh, these guys would be short plus guys would be evacuating their supers. Um, there is a bit of a counterpoint to that thing. Uh, number one is 
they logged all their supers on in the in a keep star, right? So we were able to see that, and that was pretty cool. And then they chose the only route, the only route that went directly by where PL live. Like if you make a left instead of a right, then you're fine. Like we can't really get there in time. <laughs> but if you make that right instead, uh, then you go right next to PL. So we were just like <laughs> sitting there waiting, waiting for them to jump through, and we we're like, okay, they did. That is completely wild. That's quite funny. Um, so you caught them and pulverized them, uh, taking out, uh, what, three Titans and three super carriers. Yeah, about half a trillion is worth. And on any other day, like half a trillion is worth of supers going down would have been like huge news, right? But of course, Eve decided that they had to one-up PL, right? Once again, they announced <laughs> a whole bunch of November changes that we'll be talking about soon. That's right. Also, I did I did you guys a disservice because I actually wrote about this for TMC again, and I called it the worst name I've ever called an article. It's actually the best name I've ever called an article, but not it didn't talk say PL kills three titans, which would have brought in readers. It was called the curious case of Iron Wolf's demise because Iron Wolf was one of the titans that died, and he was the other leader of darkness that kind of lost the uh, or was pushed out of darkness by sort, and uh, was basically uh, told to leave. And uh, when his a new alliance left they got so uh, there's a lot to this story i think it's got about four or five layers but the reason i bring up all these events well actually there's one more event that we want to talk about and that is that uh, pl is on contract in high sec is, is this where you stop talking at least oh yeah i mean <laughs> at least, at least this, is a contract? Know, ongoing contracts and stuff we can't really talk about and stuff like that or confirm or deny mm. but i'll just like to say that there is stuff going on in high sec uh, which somehow PL managed to not completely screw up, which we historically do whenever we <laughs> leave low sec or high sec. It has to do with um, uh, citadels and high sec and, and stuff like that. Yeah, which is uh, which is interesting because uh, PL is actually their uh, ticker sign is negative ten, which is very dangerous if you have a negative ten standing in high sec. So I wonder how that's going to work. Yeah, so we have. A, a calendar event and has no expiration on it and it's been there for a while like get your sex status above negative two so we can do some certain things right like we've always needed this because a lot of our wormhole highways kind of have high set connections somehow that we have to go through so we've been pushing for this away from being like pure negative 10 but this is one of those cases where if we're totally negative 10 it's uh it sucks <laughs> you're gonna have concord take it yeah, exactly. Or uh, the way it works is, I believe you become like a global suspect, so everyone you in Eve can shoot you, regardless of. Yeah, you do, and you have Facpo following you relentlessly. It is the faction police. Woo -woo. Oh, I like the idea of everybody being able to shoot you when you're. Yeah, we have uh, we have a lot of members of the ministry that are true negative ten, so they have to deal with that everywhere and go gang something. Well, that's funny. Well, um, so that brings me to uh, the the big question I wanted to ask you, at least because you're the one that may have coined the phrase here. But is the uh, new world order a real? Th <laughs> Maybe we can explain that. A I mean, what is a real thing, anyways? So um, <laughs> I like uh, the one thing. The one thing that I think is is interesting about uh, certain alliances and certain groups is. Um, that they like change. And PL is one of those groups that, that really is like, they like change. They're not, if you helped us yesterday, it's okay if you're our enemy tomorrow. Like, that, we don't have any problems with that. And this is part of the reason why, why PL functions. Like, a lot of our FCs came from hot, previously hostile um, alliances. Like, Killer B, the, the one who, who did a lot of the legwork, at least on PL side in World War B, came directly from Nelly Secunda. Uh, Ron Mexico, another great FC that comes from... Um, that came from Black Legion, an alliance that we had been warring with forever. Like uh, those things, like history doesn't really matter in PL, right? So the, this idea is that uh, during in in some of the fights, we had uh, decided to help some goons out. Like there's uh, some camaraderie between some PLFCs and some goon FCs, right? So they they like to work together. PL is is very much a meritocracy, right? So. Uh, the person who is the most active FC gets to make a lot of the uh, calls as far as standings and stuff like that. So working with uh, alliances that, that might be considered hostile from not too long ago, um, that's not outside of, uh, out of the question, right? Like, we don't have total hell wars and, and unforgivable friends and unforgivable enemies 
Um, with, probably with the exception of NC. We're like friends with NC. for a while. Uh, part of that is because I forgot to reset them once, and it just kind of stuck for like a year. And we're like, eh, let, let's just be friends. But as far wow. as enemies go, uh, <laughs> uh, we don't really hold on to grudges, right? Because in EVE Online, if you hold on to a grudge, it doesn't really doesn't work for you. And it, I think it also perpetuates a, a very stale gameplay if you hold on to friends for a little bit too long. And I'm sure a lot of people will, will point out the irony of how we've been glued to NC. for like four years. But you're married at this point. They like, come in I, law, I think. <laughs> I kind of agree with that, actually. I, uh, I've i lost a Titan to NC Dot, and I've lost a Titan to PL, personally. And <laughs> yeah, whatever. Can't let it bother you. Yeah. Um, you know, we thought we had uh, Vince Draken on and uh, Grath at the same time, and we asked the question, what is that special relationship between PL and... and uh, uh, and see, and they went into it a little bit, and it was very interesting. Those are old friendships and stuff. And uh, yeah, there's a question in here by Nanak uh, who's saying, um, is, is NC a pet of PL or is PL a pet of NC? And I don't think either group see themselves as pets to the other, uh, more like a cooperative, um, you know, alliances, heavy hitters. I mean, if you look yeah, at they're very um, identical. If you look at some of the, the numbers from the SH1 fight, for instance, uh, you can see which group has more people and be able to put more groups on the ground. It's not that surprising. NCDOT can field more supers and more subcaps at the same time, right? So kind of a kind of like NCDOT are currently stronger. They've got 50% more people than us as an alliance. And uh, they're they're very capable. I mean, a lot of people like to, to give, to, to pose that question, which one's the pet? But we're kind of just bros, you know, I, right? We, it, we try not to fight yeah. each other for content. We... Very rarely are we in the same like area of space. As fun, funny and strange as that sounds, like a lot of times, especially historically, when NC dot was in the north, we were in the south. When they were in the east, we were in the west. Because when we're together, we we end up taking fights from one another, uh, unless those fights are too big for either of us to take alone. And then that's when we kind of merge together. Obviously, PL is the pet because we're the one that doesn't have a keep start. That is true. Well, PL has no keep start. <laughs> I, never I think will. that, and there's a reason for that. And Travis's Titan getting doomsday by a keep star and losing it to its own keep star <laughs> is the reason why people will never have a keep star. <laughs> funny they, they, so. uh, uh, are we talking about PK's uh, Titan? We're talking about PK's Titan, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's all right. PK uh, lost a Titan. Uh, basically, it was um, brother on brother violence there, and the the keep star the keep star destroyed a Titan uh, just a few days ago. Um, yeah. So, so, so NC has the unenviable honor of being on the first time killed by a keep star and the first time lost to a keep star all at the same time <laughs> <laughs> but, but killboard's neutral so there we well, go yeah that's as far true as the alliance is concerned it's still negative <laughs> i mean you guys mind for that titan so it doesn't count anyways ne ne <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think if you, if you, and then we'll move on after this, but if you look at both, uh, the way I see it from the inside, and this may be offset, or I don't know if it is or isn't, it shouldn't be, it's really stupid if it is, but it seems like PL is a lot more active in finding things to do, and NC is kind of like, yeah, let's go do whatever, you know, comes to us and stuff. So a lot of the... I think a lot of content comes by way of PL. Not all of it, but some of it does. Uh, when I think that's different. You guys might be smaller, and we might be bigger and heavier, but you guys find more content, and we kind of jump on the content if it's big enough to share. Yeah, I think PL on a whole are kind of lazier and harder to motivate, so we always have to keep moving. If we if we stay in one place for too long, we kind of uh, get lost in other things, I guess, <laughs> or get <laughs> sidetracked and just forget how to log in and forget how to do things. So we're like constantly trying to uh, to, to keep moving. Uh, in, in GB, that's, it's a little bit harder with jump changes, but uh, find a way through wormholes. It's a little bit trier. That's normal, though. Yeah, that's normal. Every every alliance needs to shake it up every now and then. Yeah, totally. All right, so that that kind of takes care of a lot of the battle news that happened around the um, the map uh, these last two weeks. Uh, we want to move on. There's a lot to talk about. PL, uh, sorry, um, CCP. Notice how I got those confused. <laughs> Oh, God. Wow. Put, a, put, put on your tinfoil. Um, so, yeah, CCP put out a lot of information uh, about November's, uh, we're going to call it an expansion now. There's probably going to be a name for it. I think, Dirk, you confirmed? What was that? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I, yeah, name. I, 
tweeted something to Seagull where I'm like, you're getting to the point now where you're probably going to have to name this. And she came back with, it's going to have a name, which would, of course, mean that it is going to be an expansion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so... and again, not, not that we should be expecting these things twice a year. It just so happens, right, that we kind of have... We had one back in back in what was it late May, which would have been kind of about the normal time that the old expansions would have hit, and now we're going to have one in what I think is later November, which is kind of around the time when the old winter one would have happened. I think that's just happenstance because what she said a while back was when they have stuff that fits into what would be an expansion, they'll do that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it might be one a year. It might be just whenever they need to. There is a big big thing to mention about that which is that um there is the two big conventions there's eve vegas in october and then there's eve uh fan fest that's usually early early in the year like april ish i think I, it shifts around so that's the time for them to showcase the news and so i think that regardless of how much they want they break away from the formal like to expansion cycle, their new cycle is related or have those two big moments of, of built-in marketing. And so I think that that will always kind of sculpt the way that we get these cadences of the big events. Right. Yeah, totally. Let's talk about that. I think um, I want to get Noisy Gamer in here a bit more and uh, Urzeal99 and Sullen, uh, but I want to start with Carneros who works in the gaming industry and has worked on the marketing side uh, for CCP. And uh, let's get uh, his view on what this huge change is, is going to be like. But uh, right before we do that, should we set this up or do we assume that everybody kind of knows what's going on with I, Ash, can you probably get a little synopsis there, Ash? Boss, yeah. set it up. Yeah, that was your cue, Ash. You oh, missed it. Give us, give us a 30 second uh, update on what this is. So basically, uh, EVE Online is going effectively free to play. There is, but instead of like adding new things for you to buy into, what they're doing is they're making a more basic clone that has limited access to your racial frigate destroyer and cruiser skills and only T1 equipment. Very, very limited production or industry or, or like, you know, manufacturing is gaining potential, but lots of that low tier combat potential. And that is now going to be free. If you have never signed up before, you can have it for free. If your character, if your account lapses, um, then it reverts back to the alpha clone. Uh, so well, you keep all your skills and all that stuff. So uh, this is the new way that we're going to have Eve. And it's a pretty big announcement. It's going to be part of a huge set of announcements, which is, uh, th which is starting to come out, surrounded around something uh, around the November patch which pretty much we figured out, yeah, it's it's an expansion. So there's a new expansion coming in November. It's going to be focused a lot around PvE, the industrial race, and kind of open things up for uh, new players and these new uh, free-to-play players. Go. Thanks. Uh, Corneros, what do you think about all this? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it as EVE going free-to-play. I would describe it as EVE adding a new free-to-play option. The, the content that you're talking about is not shifting to free-to-play. It's becoming available additionally to free-to-play players. If you're a subscriber, you're not getting it for free. You're actually paying for it and you're absorbing it a little bit differently. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why I recommend messaging it a little bit differently. Right now, the trend in the industry is not going toward free-to-play. It's actually going the other direction, leaving free-to-play and more toward pay-to-play or subscription or other options. And I'll tell you why. There are pros and cons to every business model out there. The negative part on the free-to-play option is that it changes the majority of players' perception of the quality of the game if they're getting it for free. They think, oh, it's free, it must not be as good. If they pay for something, they actually try harder at it, they give it a little bit more attention, they invest a little bit more effort into seeing if they're going to like it or not. Because they just sunk 
50 bucks, 60 bucks, 75 bucks, or whatever it feels like in their currency and their pay scale to them. Uh, so uh, it, it can change the, the brand meaning of the word Eve if we associate the word free to play with it too much. Right now, Eve has various brand meanings associated with the word Eve Online. You think difficult, not for everyone. You, you think uh, harsh, you think steep learning curve. And those aren't, those aren't necessarily good or bad terms, they're kind of both. But that's the reality of what you think when you hear Eve Online. You don't think low quality. You, you, in terms of quality, you probably think high quality. It's still a pay to play game. It's still a subscription game in a, in a time when not very many of those exist. So what, what I would recommend is if I were talking to, to CCP right now, I'd say, guys, pay attention to your positioning. I know you're worried about, or not worried. I know you're concerned about exploits with hordes of free to play characters. And you're carefully watching that. You're aware of the risk. You're walking to it with your eyes open. You've got various options available to you, not all of which you have disclosed yet to the members. Great, you're on top of it. I wanna add one more risk to your pile. Pay attention to your brand positioning. Eve is a quality subscription game that has just added a free to play option. Think of it that way. So you don't reposition your game. I, uh, thanks. that is a super insightful. Thank you very much for that. And that really helped cement something that, or like I've been kind of trying to figure it out. And I think you put it into words really well. It's really what we're going to have is two gaming experiences, completely different gaming experiences. In what normally people think of free-to-play, you just kind of have the free-to-play experience, and then you buy, and the free-to-play experience is designed to kind of poke at you a little bit, and then you can buy either ways to stop the poking or ways to kind of cheat past things, right? In, in this case, what's really happening is you have two classes of players. You have completely legitimately fine alpha clones and completely legitimately fine omega clones. It just so happens that the capacity of the omega clones within this universe is greater than, than the alpha clones, but that's okay because EVE is all about a difference of capacity between players, right? The entire skill system is designed to ensure that players are meeting players of different skill levels. But what's interesting is that this makes a new skill or uh, power ceiling right? We're now going to have two standards of evaluation. We're going to have what can you do with an alpha clone and what can you do with an omega clone? And you're going to see people pushing both of those sides and both of those game styles. And so I think that you know people will flip between the two, but you're also going to see basically an emergence of a different kind of player that appreciates this different kind of gameplay. Uh, I mentioned it in on grid and actually there is, I think, one of the posts on the Matani mentioned RuneScape. I mentioned Arc Age, but there are other games, and particularly other games that take a lot of that like harshness and the e the real market and you know the sandbox nature. Those games that have gone free to play or are free to play that do this kind of surf and king mode between the two almost universally have been extremely successful with that, and that's worth noting. Let me point out yeah. one thing on that. Though. If you play EverQuest, which I work on, or EverQuest 2, or if you play World of Warcraft or, or another MMORPG, you might be used to uh, a curve that goes beginning players play here, then players play here, then here, then here, they level up, up, they get to an end game, and then they go off to do stuff with players of their rank up there. That's not EVE. If you're new to EVE, that's not Eve. Mm. Eve mixes everyone in one place. It's like going to a shopping center, a shopping mall. People of all parts of society will be in there. Young people, old people, all mixed. Going to a football game, you're going to be all mixed in one place. Eve's like that. 
and the gameplay doesn't hide the end game gameplay from you until you level up to max level. That's a foreign concept in EVE Online. Everyone's mixed all in one place. And you can act and participate at that level meaningfully. Everyone has the opportunity to affect everyone else's gameplay. Uh, Nosy Gamer, did you write about this? Yes, I did. Uh, before I go on a, a little bit, though, one of the things that really drives me crazy about this is when people call this free-to-play because free-to-play has such a negative connotation. And if and I really hate it when people try to compare EVE to RuneScape because RuneScape has a reputation as a pay-to-win game with lots of body and an RMT in it. And because that game bans millions of accounts every year uh, for uh, botting and RMT. So when you're when if, if you want to promote the game, if you want to say good things about the game, you don't compare it. You don't say free to play. You don't compare it to RuneScape. And I would say don't even compare it to ArcAge. Um, it, it, that's just one of those things. It, it's 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 you know a lot of just... players are. Um, a lot of players are ambassadors for the game, and there's just we gotta learn how to promote the game and talk about it. Just as a slight segue into that point, um, there was an interesting thing when I was looking through the headlines from various um, gaming sites that there was only one site that kind of got the emphasis of what this was all about across in their headline. The rest of them were like free to play. Straight off. Exactly. The gaming press is so horrible. And as, as we know, I mean, we're talking on the Matani.com, which was founded because their gaming press is so bad. Well, uh, just, I'd like to, I'd like to take the bullet that. for TMC tonight because I, I wrote free to play in my title for the article here. It's, it's not just the gaming press, by the way. I used to be a journalist before I went into the games industry. All of the press out there is has an accuracy rate that would disappoint you if you knew the worst part about so, that is that you'll never hear about it though because uh, by the time anyone finds out about it it's already done and no one cares anymore so so when people like go onto the articles i write about eve and start going hey this didn't happen i shouldn't feel so bad <laughs> so so i got a question since everybody decided to pick on my the, my word choice earlier uh i see people or, or my headline yeah or your headline <laughs> it's all right uh so there's a lot of people referring to it as a forever trial and that pricks me up because i actually don't like the idea of of the forever trial i was just mentioning in chat that um in world of warcraft I have my main character that I loved dearly, and I wanted to go dabble in World of Warcraft, and I logged in, and sure, I could make a new character and play him up to level 20 and play him however I want, but I can't log in my main character, and then why am I even doing this? In EVE, I now know that I can always log into Ashtarothi. I can always do something. I could forget about EVE for five years, and then one day I see something and be like, you know what? I'm going to do this. No commitment required no anything like that and i think that that's a big thing that just the phrase forever trial seems to miss well i think that's because there are actually sort of two elements that are trying to be achieved here by this one thing right there is there is that um kind of unlimited trial that is you know trying to give that new player experience a, you know, a bit of a longer runway let's call it right that you're not compressed down into 14 or 21 days in order to you know decide whether or not you want to actually become a paying member and then there is also the veteran aspect of it where i don't guys try i don't know that it's so much about allowing you know veterans to you know play limited free to play or something like that as much as it is giving an opportunity for them to stay connected into the game at a very very low level um because if they are still connected inside the game then maybe something happens that they do resub for that's See, important well uh, yeah go ahead carnero no it's just it, that's important every time uh, people who've been playing the game for a long time who see an old familiar name log back in and just come and say hi. That that uh, is emotionally powerful. It's it's meaningful to people. It releases chemicals in your bloodstream. 
it's, it's it, physiological. Yeah, I've actually seen that in my corp. Uh, we've had people come back after six years recently in the last week, and it's almost like um, people are getting them a chair and sitting them down and bringing them a drink. And you can see that happening, saying like, you know, is your stuff sorted? We can help move your stuff. And here's, you know, your old Titan back. <laughs> so, okay, NC is a little different than other places. But yeah, there's like a lot of let's get you back to uh, who you were before and stuff. Well, the, um, the exciting thing about that, one yeah. more thing, there's another thing that's coming or supposedly coming that's a huge piece to all of this or potentially a huge piece to all of this. If they come out with the app or other mechanisms to allow you to communicate between the game, now they don't have to worry about whether or not you have a subbed account or anything like that. They can just create a direct feed into your corp chat or whatever because you're never not subscribed, right? It, or you're never, kinda... you're never kicked out. So now Ooh. you don't leave. Your corp chat can be on your phone anytime that you want or something well, like in, that. Well, in, in, in a big way, they're taking back like the meta, right? Because I think Marsha was pointing out you can sit in Discord, you can type on Reddit, and you're basically playing EVE, like, and you're using EFT or whatever else to make calculations. But it seems like they're capturing that back a little bit, which is it's very interesting. Uh, Sullen, you're in the CSM, and you got this a few days before it came out. Do you want to talk about uh, this? Talk yeah, sure. I was just kind of listening in, just seeing what people actually felt about it. Uh, yeah, we had access to it about three days beforehand, and you know, had a chance to kind of really dig into it and see what we thought about it. Um, were you really, surprised? Yes. I mean, we were pretty much, I mean, when they got done announcing it to us, actually, so the video that you all saw, um, basically, that described what was happening, we actually got to see that. And, I mean, you could hear a pin drop from Reykjavik all the way here in the U.S. It was that silent after they said it. <laughs> I mean, it was just completely silent. I mean, we had to soak it in. Then we had this, you know, multi-page document that we were reading and we're just digging into it, trying to figure out like, all right. And the, and the, the funny thing is the first thing the CSM thought of is the same thing that most veterans are thinking, how is this going to get broken and how are we going to screw it up? Because EVE players, we love to do that. <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah, we we're do. just like, look at this great feature. And the first thing every EVE player seems like wants to do is just take it and mangle it and see like, how can we screw this up and take advantage of it? We are certainly um, the reason why we can't have nice things. Yes, we are. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing right now, a lot of veterans are worried about, like, how is it going to be taken advantage of? And I can tell you right now, every possible angle that people are talking about has been just an ongoing discussion. We have, like, I mean, it's almost hourly that someone pops up with, you know, what about this? What happens if this happens? Uh, and CCP is very adamant. They want to make sure that veterans are not going to just take advantage of this. Um, and they have a lot of options which they can actually utilize if they think that this is going to be a problem. The other thing about it that is awesome is the fact that this is also coming at the same time they're kind of revamping the new player experience. And this actually mm. ties into it perfectly because of the fact that, um, you know, everyone's been really on them with limiting your racial skills. Like, you can't do anything except for whatever your base race is. Well, there's a reasoning for that because... On the one hand, it limits that you can't extract because roughly all the skills, when you add them all up, come up to about 5 million. And so you can't extract. But that's just half of it. Really, the bigger thing, though, is that for a new player starting, that allows them to focus kind of on what their race is that they have. And as opposed to with the trial, you're basically telling them, here is, you know, 16, 20, whatever, 50 days. By the way, train as much as you can, whatever you want, and have had it. Good luck. And uh, may the luck be in your favor, you know? That's always the big thing. It's like whenever we, uh, I've spoken to new players coming into the game and they're going, what do I trade? I don't know what to do. It's like focus on one thing. Right. And this forces them to actually focus on one thing. Because if you think about it, if you only have about five million to train, you can make a decent, you know, Galente frigate. If you are focused only on Galente frigates and only on Galente weapons, you can make a decent frigate for five million. You cannot make a decent Galente frigate if you've got two million in Minmatar weapons. You know, oh well, Amar sounded cool. I want to try that, and you're just splitting it all up. So that's the other reasoning behind that. That's a really interesting wrinkle to it as well. Uh, the specialization in Eve is, is kind of what separates it uh, from everyone else, and it sort of tells you really early on about what the game is about, right? If you specialize in one thing, you can be a young player and be as good, or even better than, a guy who's played EVE for two years if he's specialized in something else. I have a, a bit of a story, like one of my friends was getting into EVE Online, and she had like 8 million skill points, 
and her skills were incredibly focused on flying one ship, just one ship in EVE Online. The only ship she can fly, and the only ship she ever cared to fly, was the Tristan. I know who you're talking about. To, when she decided to learn PvP, with only 8 million skill points, she became the, the pilot in that month who had more kills than anyone else in that Tristan. And like the person under her was like a four-year-old character. The person under that was like a two-year-old character. And then she was just sitting with, with 8 million skill points dominating sort of the that sort of uh, the niche. Uh, aspect of the game. And, and uh, exactly, that niche of the game. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't cool. call that a normal kind of thing, though, for Eve. No, I mean, no. I mean, one of the things that has all, always it's... been... You know, it does show you like the capabilities of Eve. It's, it's probably a really good example of what is possible to do in Eve. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that's been a hot topic is you know um, they haven't really announced any limitations yet, which I mean I don't blame CCP because they're trying to keep that kind of close to the chest for the moment to figure out what limitations they want. Because I mean, in reality, they would love to make it so that it's not limited. You know, basically your only limitation is what you can train into for ships. Um, but they haven't announced like any limitations in terms of like, oh, well, we will be restricting them from doing this. And that's for a reason they want new players to be able to experience the game. But they also at the same time understand some things probably will have to be restricted just purely because we're mm. new players and we know what we're going to you, do. You mean uh, they're not restricting ganking yet because uh, they want them to be able to I'm, experience yeah, that. that. Yeah, and that topic in itself has just been a constant debate. I mean, pretty much. Of, it's on, uh, pretty hilarious. It's the, Urziel, uh, do you have uh, you're polishing off all your instructional videos because you think there's going to be a wave <laughs> of new players coming in, right? What are your thoughts on this this whole chain? Um, as far as getting warm bodies in, I have absolutely no problem with that because the 21 day trial, or if you play games and extend it through various means, it's still not long enough. You're still just scratching the surface of this game. Yep. And totally. that bit about suicide ganking being a problem. And no. I think that's I think that's something that's kind of important. What he just stated, in that Eve Online, it doesn't matter as much what skills you've trained as much as how much time and in, you've invested into it. And the problem is that I think everyone will agree, twenty one days <laughs> or fifty days is not nearly enough time to really know everything Eve has to offer. Exactly, and I, I think that's really an important point because when I started playing Eve. I was kind of aware that there was this thing called suicide ganking. Was I interested? Not really. And I think the ratio of people that would be interested in doing that and using these accounts for that will not actually differ from the ratio that people currently use accounts for doing that. I, I, I see no well, reason to think that. Well, that and they're bound to the very low end of the spectrum when it comes to suicide ganking. Yeah, yeah exactly. Basically, they need to make it so that suicide ganking is just, like, you can do it, but it's just not worth it. There's other things that are better to do. Well, yeah. to, with a T1 and it, and it is. I mean, just, you're not going to be worth it. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, <laughs> but, but, but the interesting thing that I find the most interesting is that the most easily accessible profession going off the skill is faction warfare. Oh, yeah. And I love that. that well, is let, yeah, so let's. Good. That's great that you brought it up. We wanted to talk about that. Um, anyone feel strongly about being able to describe why uh, Faction War may benefit from this? Well, obviously. Oh, okay, I'll let Ashrath go, and then I'll talk about it. Right yeah. Now. Okay. So, in Faction Warfare, it is the only area in space where PvP is really mandated to be a specific ship size. We function in these complexes that either restrict it to frigate only, uh, well, actually T1 frigate only, which is coincidentally what they can fly, and then destroyer down, uh, cruiser down, and then open to everybody, right? So these complexes are where we fight most of our battles, or a lot of our battles, and it'll, it allows us to, it's what we fight our control over. And it's also how we make our money. And so going around in the, all these plexes and stuff like that, uh, and either taking the plexes or fighting people who are taking the plexes is kind of the way that faction warfare works when you're not in a fleet. And so mm -hmm. the fact that there's just not only more people out there, which makes the uh, engagement more interesting, and also a lot of them are using fairly rudimentary equipment, you can do it in rudimentary equipment. Because if nobody shows up, then you're just sitting at a button for 10 minutes and then you're receiving your bacon and going home. Yep. So 
it is incredibly accessible to new players. It's so accessible that they actually added Faction Warfare to the free trial, um, probably as a test bed to see whether or not it would work. Uh, you know, to see if we would do exactly what everybody always says. Oh, they're just going to make a million alts and plex everything. Well, it's been on free trial for a year now, and we haven't really seen that. So it's clearly not breaking Faction Warfare. So basically, we've just gotten this really good place for new players to find good PvP. They can ensure that anybody who comes to fight them is at least their class of si uh, size ship or smaller. Um, mm. And they get rewarded in money for fighting. It's one of the only places where the game itself mechanically rewards you for being combat ready. And apart from maybe getting caught in a gate, um, Faction Warfare is probably the closest you're going to get to consensual PvP other than dueling mechanic in the high sec as well. Because you can sit there and descan and see what arrives and go, I'm going to fight that, or no, I'm not going to fight that. So, you know, it's I think also. That's great. It's also interesting because it's the only place in EVE, well, they might not be the only place in EVE, but it is the biggest place in PvP in which you have absolute guaranteed assurance of where the aggressor is coming from. And so the, the defense, the, the be, being able to set up a defense inside of a plex is a massive advantage. So home court mm -hmm. in these plexes are really... Uh, is really important. That creates all sorts of really interesting engagements. It's very often not about destroying your opponent. It's often about who can drive them away so that that way the other people can turtle up and, and set up themselves or, you know, whatnot, which is... So, Faction Warfare has only gotten more and more interesting, and with the boost changes and the incoming flux of people that are going to just function as free grunts, we're already talking about, like, we're just going to set up our own industry program and just start churning out Galente, T1, everything, cr Cruiser down, and just be like, here you go, guys, let's mm -hmm. go kill stuff. Yeah, uh, Lise, did you want to say something about that? Um, yeah, he actually touched on, like, basically all the main points that I think are good, and, um, and obviously... As someone who <laughs> operates in faction warfare, he, he should be able to like uh, to reiterate. Basically, it's just that it, it's gonna it's a great place for these type of players to be. Like it's the only thing faction warfare is lacking at times is just more people, and this is going to be more people that can experience like flying around in a novice complex or a small complex. Um, the one of the things that we've kind of been dancing around a little bit of is the demographic of player that's going to be um, interested in these alpha clones. Now, obviously, when you talk about the new player experience, uh, the goal is to get new people into the game. But I think a lot of uh, of things, or a lot of people who are going to be using the Alpha clones, at least early on, are old players who just fell in, just fell out of love with the game, or just couldn't keep up with it for whatever reason, didn't have the time, didn't have the desire, got burned out, and got distracted by something else. Um, personally speaking, I played the game for for over a decade, so my Steam like friends list is filled with people who used to play Eve, who I play other games with. And every once in a while, they see Eve on the news, or Eve, they just think about Eve for whatever reason, and they ask me, like, how the game's going and stuff like that, because they know I'm, like, a huge try-hard turbo nerd in Eve still. Like, they're, they're still <laughs> up. They still know that much. Um, and I, I tell them all about Eve, and they're like, man, that sounds really great. I wish I could play that game right now uh, for, like, 40 minutes or something, but I don't feel like subbing for a month, and I don't feel like coming to that commitment. I don't want to play Eve... I don't want totally. my second job to be Eve again. Um, so why don't we just go play World of Warships, Dota, or League of Legends, so we can just play the game for like 40 minutes and, and be done with it, right? And then go on to do whatever else you can do. And Faction Warfare, the way it is now, it's not always like this. It's not perfect. But um, I can undock in Faction Warfare space, fly around for 30 or 40 minutes, get into two or three fights, and that's my consumption for Eve for the day. Like, I don't have to worry about going on a fleet. I don't have to worry about committing a few hours or something. I can go AFK if I have to. And that style of gameplay, I think, is very alluring for um, not only modern gamers, but, like, gamers my age and stuff like that. I'm, I'm getting right. up there. I'm in my 30s. So, like, I can't always oh. just say, oh, I'm going to hang out the, all summer oh and just play Oh, my God, Eve. so old. I know, yeah. I know. I'm going to get back. <laughs> but, yeah, so, so the, know, the big thing is, is who is going to benefit the most from this? What type of demographic is going to benefit the most? And I'm really, really hopeful and very excited for the prospect of like a lot of my old friends to be able to say, oh, I'm going to go get in a Tristan. You can take a, a Griffin and I'll be in a Thorax and we can just go roam around these faction warfare things. It's really cheap. It's really accessible. It's something I already know how to do. I already have the skills for because I have like a 40 million skill point character and 
now maxed out five mil like alpha state and they can experience how much the game has changed because the game has changed like when you play the game constantly you don't realize it how much the game has changed but if you go back and look at videos that are two or three years old you're gonna see yeah, like totally. graphically the game is stunning the mechanics are way more balanced now than they were four or five years ago so a lot of those players that used to play you that used to know eve or who think they know eve as this like cold <laughs> evil place with, with jerks <laughs> all over the place um will be able to experience like the the new brand of eve and maybe just maybe like some of those people will say you know what i'll stick with this for a month and see what happens or i'll be able to have fun in faction warfare with my friends every once in a while without actually flexing to the game and if, even if they just do that even if they just interact in low sec in some way they're contributing to the game so much the fact that i as an omega clone uh, can go out and go kill some alphas who wouldn't have otherwise been there is amazing for me that's a huge boon to like the amount of joy i would have in game in the game i i just want to point out that uh, the uh one of the things that uh happens as you get older is your address book uh, people start to get marked off uh because they you know pass away uh not that they move somewhere but they're actually gone from this world and that's kind of funny to look at your list that's like eight years old which feels like an eternity for eve and to think that these people can come back at any moment like they're resurrected it's an interesting concept uh and i, I it, interesting to get your perspective at least because i remember you were way out front on this um talking about it uh some time ago and, and you were really endorsing the idea that they should finally embrace it and let people in and let's face it, they let people in for free. It's not free to play, but it's, um, I think the game has changed. It's become more like a play to win, but you can freely exist. So and it's a, it's both, and it's both uh, a way of getting into the game. It's also a way of putting yourself in a, in a stasis that you have access to the game. So there's a lot of people who can just kind of stay connected. And so well, that's why I feel like it's the meta stuck in. That kind of depends though on your, uh, I mean, definition of winning the game though. I mean, right. That, that, can you can you actually win the game anymore by leaving the game? Nope. Everybody loses now. It's like <laughs> it's just like the game. Everybody's playing the game. But that's but that's the crazy thing. Yeah. That it's like now that I know if my if I ever like go away for a while, my subscription just sort of peters out. That all my characters are still going to be training their skill cues, and they're still going to be doing well. No, things. you're not going to well, be no, skilling your, after five million. You're not training a skill queue. so you could like train another oh, alpha guy. Not. No, no it's, it's not after it's not after five million. It's after you've after you've trained the limited number of skills that you it's, can train, which adds both. up to about five million. It's both. Right. It that's seems to me that that's a mistake. Well, because okay, we'll, we'll see if it gets clarified. But I, I, it, I read it to understand it both. If it is a if it is uh, limiting, they'll probably revisit that later. Yeah, yeah, they should. They should. Because as long as you have it ticking away, it's always on your mind. Like if you say, oh, a year, a year from now, yeah, you're like, totally. oh, what? I'm going to go, I'm going to go check in on that character. And oh, look, I have 50,000 skill points to like put wherever I want. That can reignite an interest. Well, the problem so I think is, the problem I'll, is that, I'll, that makes I'll, infinite skill farms. Well, no, yeah, but you but just it do doesn't. it slower. Well, but it, right, it doesn't but if excuse, I, you don't even have to pay for them. Uh, Tiberius? Maybe. But, 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 I'll, I'll, Okay, so maybe I'm kind of looking at it from a slightly different perspective in the fact that I'm looking at it from um, an X dust 5 on 4 player in the fact that... Oh, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was like, I turn my character, I do my thing, like play the game solidly for maybe two or three months, grind some skills, put some skills in, walk away, because I got a little bit bored with it, and then... A little bit later, something would go, hey, you know what? You know, I've probably got some skills there that I can inject. What, what, what's that got me? And they get on, and suddenly it's like I'm in a candy store. I'm like, oh, I could do this, and I could do that, and I could do this. And, oh, I'm injecting this, and I'm injecting that. And, oh, my God, this is amazing. And then I'm going straight back out, and I'm playing for another two or three months. Because while I was away, it was just ticking up. It was ticking up slowly, like super slowly. If you in Dust, you could play for Omega implants, which I think is where a lot of this inspiration for Alpha and Omegas come from. You could play for Omega implants, which accelerated your SP gain. But it actually, it actually came from the old clone system, where we had different clones for each how much skill points it could maintain. Without, and when you got killed, you had to buy the correct level clone again mm. and then that got pulled into dust and then that got pulled into yeah okay uh, you see yeah what I mean. you see where I'm yeah Cornera Corner Corneras, do you uh you seem to be nodding when we were talking about this point uh, do you have anything to add to that 
Well, it is it is powerful to if you if if it's not fitting you right now, but it's ticking up in the background and it's building value. It is powerful to come back to it later. There's a whole there's a uh, a, a, a subset of the player base whose personality will respond to that and will think, oh, wow, I just found this value. Now I can do the things that were frustrating me before that I didn't have quite enough skill for. And that will that will solve uh, uh, that will overcome an objection for them, and they'll be in. So at, at this point, I want to ask the uh, the live audience there in chat if you guys want to put in what your biggest takeaway is from this. Is it you know? Uh, I'll just give you an example: more more players in Eve. But go ahead and type that in there and uh, tell us what you think this this change would do to Eve. Like you know, your phrase, Asher, you had something? I think Caleb right. just said the greatest thing about this whole change. Which is that this is literally a Jesus figure uh, or feature because it's the Alpha and the Omega. Oh my god! Ba baby Jesus. Oh my god! If that is intentional, I give every props oh, to go. all of we, them. There you go. We got a new name for the upcoming expansion: Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, all, right. all right. I'm going to, you know, um, one of the things that this is going to do, though, is bring in a lot of looky loos, people who want to come in and see what this is all about because they That's hear about okay. it. That's okay. That's okay. That's totally fine. It, it's well, great. Well, we like it this. is okay, and it's one of the things that is taking up a lot of the time in in the forums and other places where feedback is coming from. Right? Is once again, if we come up with a reason why people want to take a look at things, what we have to do is make sure that stuff is going on in the back end that is is retaining more of the people that come in, and that's why so much of what's being talked about has to do with. A, the new player experience, and then B, whatever they're doing with PVE and things around those you know, areas um, that I hope gets brought out soon to answer some of people's um, concerns that what we might see is a big free influx in and the same 4% that stick around. Okay, let me tee this up a little bit better because I want to roll this video and I'm going to explain what the background is. This is uh, Brave, which was a big uh, new person coalition, newbies. Um, we're taking on a, a medium-sized or big uh, alliance uh, called uh, Cult of War. And they Cult of War dropped capitals on them. And so here they are. These are guys that are inexperienced, and you're going to listen to their comms as NC Dot comes into the fray uh, to destroy... It's like you're you're seeing a small fish being hunted by a bigger fish, and then a giant fish comes in and eats the middle fish. And here you go. Let's uh, keep it quiet if we can, because I want to hear the audio. Guys, try to get on the mic. Uh, my guys, try to get on that crow. My guys, try to get on that crow. That's NC. 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 That's, that's, NC, that's NC, NC, that's NC, that's NC, that's NC, 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 NC. Guys, oh my, God. my guys, my guys, my guys, hold on gate, hold do on not, gate, interceptors, hold on do not aggress the NC super, interceptors, do not aggress the NC supers. Guys with Nancy Crow, hold on gate, hold on gate, guys with Nancy Crow, hold on gate. Getting aggressed. Deep breath. Just sit back and off. Stop bubbling. NC Titan on field, NC Titan on field, NC Airbus. Holy shit. Stand by, stand by. My guys, make sure you make sure you ping Phoenix. It's doomsday. Phoenix is going down. Oh my God, doomsday! Holy shit, doomsday! Fucking stand by. Make sure, make sure. Jump, 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 jump. QBQ, jump, QBQ, jump, QBQ. We need to stop bubbles, don't we? NC just. Stand by. Broadcasting, broadcasting, broadcast. Guys, bubbles stop. Bubbles stop. All my, all guys in my fleet, stop dropping bubbles. Stand by. Primarying the two engageable, engageable capital. Stand by. Small. And so basically the reason I bring out that video and one of the reasons I saved it is not just because it's NC, but because the excitement that is pouring out of these guys seeing the things they've read about uh, is palpable. I mean, you definitely, you, you take away that um, seeing these things in the game is pretty impressive to them. Yeah, I think that's one of the, one of the coolest things uh, that I remember from like one of the, my favorite Eve trailers, like the like the This Is Eve trailer, like the excitement that people had doing different tax, tasks. Like some people were excited for a bomb run, pretty famously. Some people were excited <laughs> for getting smart bombs. Some people were excited for just bridging through a Titan for the very first time. Like um, I remember I, I uh, when Brave was just becoming a thing, um, I decided to, to try something with streaming 
and I wanted to see like how far I could get pretending to be a newbie in Eve doing what I called like the 30 day challenge. Like I would just play on a trial account. I wanted to see like how much of Eve I could experience um, pretending to be a newbie, right? And whenever Brave would go out, and of course I put on my ultimate Brave at the time. PL weren't fighting, so don't you don't have to yell at me for being a spy master for newbies. <laughs> but um, Good at the time, uh, just the excitement level of Brave because everyone was new, seeing this for the first time, and every so often you would see a Titan, and the the reaction that those people had, like the the players had who had never seen such a huge ship before, um, it was just it, it made me love the game so much more. Like reinvigorated me made me want to play some more because they were just so excited to see something that i see like literally every time i play eve and i take it for granted um so so every time i see something like that i get i kind of like my heart grows three sizes i, I, I like to think say, oh, oh i mean and i was just gonna say another thing to remember is that I, I don't know if they i don't know if they finalized or said if you're going to be able to tell like when you die to a little rifter I don't know if they've even said if you're going to be able to know if they're an alpha yet. I you know can't. You cannot. They, they do not make any uh, discrimination so, between alpha and omega clones, which I think is perfect. Yes, which, yeah, I think is awesome. Yeah, it's perfect. yeah they, they should not visually. I'm not even sure they should in in the API. Well, uh, well, there's well, some we'll API see. stuff tied to that. Beyond, uh, but, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, but the thing is on the field, like, when you make a fleet ping and you're saying, hey, we need blah, 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 and we need tackle frigates and stuff. I mean, you could have, like, you know, a bunch of guys and tackle frigates that you don't even know are alphas, but whatever. Who, who's, who doesn't want them happy to join their fleet? You'll know when, when you say, hey, get into this, and they'll be like, oh, I can't right now. <laughs> I can't get really? into that either. Oh, I can't get into what? that either. Why are you going to tech one? I'm still training for that. <laughs> well, <laughs> Why are you going to tech one cruiser? <laughs> Going back a little bit to uh, what was being said about the kind of the what you can do in 30 days, I think that a lot of this has less to do with the fact that whether or not Eve is changing in this way, but it really is a, a, an admission that the 21 day trial just doesn't work. And in fact, the trial just doesn't work for Eve altogether. It's just a failure of the trial yeah, totally. system. Because well, this idea that you have to make a decision before you even understand the game, you have to make a decision to pay for it and and it's not just like a normal video game where it's like i'm going to try it out it has a subscription and even though yes you can stop your subscription at any time when you ask somebody to enter into a subscription they are dealing with the mental tax of of a recurring they're thinking this is a recurring thing this is now a thing i'm going to be paying for and that's part of the decision it's not just like a game hey do i have 15 bucks right now mm -hmm. um you know, whatever and so having to make that decision within 21 days is just it doesn't work <laughs> I was going to say, that's like, a really good point. Agree. Go on. Well, yeah. Ty Tiberius, and then, Tiberius and then Solon. All right, let's go. Okay, cool. So, but that's an interesting point because throughout the years, um, I've now been playing it for four years, I've met people that kind of meet all sorts of different parts of the spectrum when it comes to that commitment. I've met people who will sign up on the game they've been playing it for a month and before you know it they've created 10 characters all subbed and they're all doing it they burn out very very quickly admittedly but they will create 10 characters they will have them all running and they'll do what they do and then they'll lose interest and move on from there where at the same time i'll have other people who will just kind of get to that point where it's like oh you got to subscribe now and you're gonna like make that commitment they kind of Oh, I'm not too sure. I don't really want to. And so, yeah. Well, there's, right. something really, there's something really... Ash, okay. Ash, hold on, hold on your thought. Sorry. Uh, Solon, go ahead. I'm trying to distribute the time. All right. So, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things I wanted to touch base on was just, um, you know, I, I don't know if you all remember, but they had the video where they were actually showing the average gamer age for EVE. And it was really cool because you could actually see how it's been moving. But one of the things that you'll notice is that it's actually increasing in age, which isn't necessarily bad i mean like you know we all Yay like for being old people older. yes that's not necessarily bad but the problem is that as gamers get older you start to lose them due to uh attrition due to life essentially people get settled down they have families and some just decide you what's know, his I'm, life yeah and i just don't <laughs> have time for games the problem is you need to replenish those ranks then with younger gamers coming up they don't always have to be younger i started eve 
when I was in my late twenties. But the thing is, you need to replenish that. And the problem that CCP was running into is that up and coming millennials right now, the people that you want to start getting in your games, have basically grown up in an age where they've been able to play uh, phone games. Uh, for free since they had a phone. They've had tablet games that they could play for free since they've had their tablet. They have literally had every opportunity to play games for free without paying a dime, or at least so they think, from the time they could start gaming. So the problem then is that you're now trying to get them into a game that it's like, well, we're going to give you 20 days, but then after that, you're done. You cannot play again until you put money into it. And that's a big problem when you're trying to recruit them because you look at other games like what Wargaming has done and they've stated like, you know, we will let you play for free, but you're not going to get these cool things. Well, guess what? A very large portion, yeah, they start playing for free, but then they realize, wow, this game is really fun. I want to start actually doing oh. the stuff that costs money. And the problem is if you have a limited time frame, you will never get that gamer base. They will literally look at it and say, I'm not going to invest a month of my time if then after a month it's done and I don't even know if I'm going to like it. And that's right. a big, big thing is that the, uh, ga uh, the gaming audience you are trying to get now is very different from what, I mean, I remember when I was in college back in the day and it was like, you know, monthly subscriptions were the norm that was the normal thing you would see in every mmo everything out there that is no longer kind of like what they're growing up with let me uh a micro point to make that cycle of people having 21 days to decide if they like the game you see them drop out after like two hours or whatever they figure out they can't make up they can't really learn enough about the game to like it in that time is totally magnified when they do a free weekend if you notice people drop out in the first few minutes like within the first half hour or something like that, which means they make the decision faster. They didn't, within the weekend, wow. they can't possibly figure out. Hold on, Ashtaroth, he has to go. He has, go ahead, Ash, you were going to say? Well, that's, that's actually exactly what I was going to say, that the problem oh, is actually sorry. even more complex than just can I learn it in 21 days? Because I've never actually had somebody make it the whole 21 days and then not sub. What happens is, is that they, they sit down, they play for a day, they go, this is awesome. What does it take to play it? It takes $15 and you got to basically suck for a long time and get punched in the face for a long time in order to figure out what it is. And I'm not saying that that's what I say, but I mean, that's basically and like it. how they, yeah. And, but that's how they have to calculate it. It's like, it's dark souls, but the UI sucks and there's no feedback go. Right. Yeah. Like, and the point I was trying to make was not necessarily that they last the 21 and they can't get it. It's more that for a large portion of the audience, they look at it as I have 21 days. Well, I'm not even going to bother with that. Exactly. I don't want to invest well, yeah. any time at all in something that I only have a month to play and then it's done or pay. And that's well, it's like thing. even it's even when you count to. Uh, I don't know if you've ever, you guys have ever seen the zero punctuation review of Eve Online. It's so so very good. Very funny. Yeah. Very funny. Where it basically goes, I've got two weeks to try this game, which is basically long enough for a holiday, and that's it. And it's so true. It, it like applies even now. That was done five years ago, and you're trying but, to like cram the entire scope of Eve into two weeks. That's what's it. funny is what's funny is is that the other half of that sentence from that post is the other reason why people quit because he talks about how he only has four in that case time fourteen days, and so that's not enough time to join a player corporation. So he doesn't, right? So mm. that's the logic theory, right? Oh, I'm I'm only checking out this game, so I'm going to go see what I can figure out about it, but I'm not going to get into anything with anybody because I don't know if I want to play it yet. But yeah. Yeah. I want to steer it from an outsider learn. point of view. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's, it's so true. Are we start are, they want to know Elise, are we starting uh, Alpha Legion? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to omit that question because he's actually answered that question in The Grid, which is a different podcast with Ashtarathi and Elise in there. And they went through a lot of this stuff. It's a very thorough podcast. I totally recommend you listen to it. And uh, he did answer that question there. And I'm going to hold it from you so you'll actually go listen to that podcast. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. but that's so good. One thing that... There... Oh, you can go. Uh, well, I was going to go on to a new topic so or a, like a new view of this. So if you have something related to what we're talking about right this second, then go. Oh, no, no, you do your thing. Okay, so one of the things that we were talking about on OnGrid, or at least I think we tried to talk about on OnGrid, but I feel like I had not fully formulated my thoughts about it, and also 
uh, I'd like to thank Carneros for helping kind of get even more perspective. But one of the things that it gets said is that if on the internet, if you're not paying for, for your subscription, you are not the customer, right? So like Facebook, you're not the customer of Facebook. The customer of Facebook are the companies that buy ad revenues. You are the you are the thing that is being sold yeah you are the not just that you're the content (laughs) like literally you're the content and so in this sense what's uh, what's interesting is that free mechanisms in e or in on the internet basically tie together people who are interested in being discovered or want to experience things and then people who want to do things to those people and are willing to pay money to do it right and so that's really important in facebook it's advertisers that want to advertise to uh the people in uh in bad pay to win free to play games it's rich people that get off on picking on poor people but or not people Mm. but uh you know non-players in (laughs) eve what's interesting is is that it's the omegas are the proletariat so it's the omegas they're basically just bringing us content Right. Every single person who logs in as a free to play account in theory, well, not everybody, but a lot of the people who be logging in as free to play accounts are not people who would be subbed if there wasn't a free to play system. And so all they are to you is free content. They're free workers. They're free people to do. So all this time we've been working to make Eve good and, and the Omega experience good to the point where all the Omegas need left to really shine is just endless droves of people. Well, and so now assuming they're to... doing something, otherwise they're just a form of background noise. I mean, they don't necessarily need to be content because there's, you know, there's a chance that those people will just use it to stay connected, but not really do anything either. Sure, but I'm not talking about that's an okay. individual decision. I'm talking that's about social content instead yes. of uh, yes. PVP content. Well, but they don't even need to, um, they really just need to log in because sometimes you just need the feeling that the place is bigger. Than you are, but it's, uh, it's more than that just alone. That. Having, go ahead. So, sorry, uh, omegas bring things to the table that alphas need, right? Alphas bring numbers. Alpha brings support. The omegas bring the tools. So if I want to go do, uh, you know, if I want to do the new PVE content, I could do it by myself, or I could buy a command ship. And instead of trying to uh, figure out how to find five Omegas that are all doing their own thing and all can solo the content and they're too good for it anyways, I can find a bunch of dudes in T1 cruisers that would love to do the stuff that I enable them to be able to do. And so I become a cornerstone to a small clutch. And actually, I did talk Uh, about this a little bit. I said, you know, this is the dad in me coming out. But, you know, you want to talk about content enablers and content consumers. This gives this gives the the power to the content creators. This, this takes you back to your your uh, uh, raid guild roots, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, well, it really the Raid leader, yeah. It appeals but, to But it also goes back to Brave, Horde, uh, Karma Fleet, all these people that are just doing their thing for the people that come in and just saying, hey, can we get a bunch of people together to go and have some fun? That's the uni. Yeah, Eve University, another good one as well. And that's um, Eve Scout. I mean, th- there's so many I can't even even like name. And that's what I well, think that we've all been kind of driving towards is that a lot of the people who have tried to naysay or try to complicate it or try to whatever think about like how Omegas are going to use alphas. But I think that the more important question, the bigger question out of all of this, is how are those alphas going to experience the game? Well, that's okay. The alphas, not new players, the alphas. And that's what I wanted to get to is who do you think's coming back? Because this works for veterans as well as it works for new players. That's people call it an unlimited trial and it is, but it's also a stasis place to fall back to when you decide you want to take a break. Remember, there's a whole thing about taking a break as an Eve player because the game's a long game. You take months and months off, sometimes years, sometimes multiple years. It's like they listen to our podcasts. You can never <laughs> leave Eve, right? You just take a little bit of a break. Even when you think you're going to quit, even when you think you get rid of everything, it'll always come back to you. And I, I know like, there are two very drastic uh, viewpoints on this, like drastically different viewpoints on this. Um, and I know Asherathi and I, like, we're exactly on the opposite side of the coin here. 
um, who is going to experience, what demographic is going to experience the most from these alpha clones, I'm pretty sure that um, a lot of uh, the alpha clone people, at least initially, will be veterans from the game, people who have played the game and just stopped for a little while for whatever reason or quit. They're going to come back, they're going to reconnect with friends, they're going to reconnect mm. with all the alliance mates, they're going to see what the game's all about, they're going to say, oh, this is pretty cool. I don't necessarily think you're going to see like an extra, uh, just a whole bunch of newbies. Obviously, you will see a bunch of newbies coming in too, but I don't think they're going to be the, the majority of the people um, experiencing like alpha clone life. And I think that's a good thing, right? Because uh, the way I would envision this, obviously, I've got no control over it, but like the way I would like to see this going, if, if I got to choose how, how this would affect the game going on, is that you wouldn't see a, a tidal wave of new players coming in on day one trying to figure out what and figure out what Eve is all about, right? You'd see a very slow and gradual buildup of players who used to play the game, playing more casually, new players coming in, learning from those older players, and just, okay, in the first month, maybe you don't see a huge increase, right? But this time next year, there's like 30% more people in space. Like that would mm. be something that I would personally see that if, if that happened, I would be like, this was a huge success, right? Here's another so, success. So if three oh. months after it goes live, and then let's say the next Eve Vegas or Eve Reykjavik uh, fan fest, if they get up on stage and do a demographics presentation and say, Here, guys, here's who came back in the first three, four months of this Alpha Clones project. And I would it turns out that. X oh. amount were your old friends returning to say hi and socialize. And Y amount where these people who had tried it once before didn't quite get hooked, but now they've had a little bit more of an opportunity because 21 days wasn't enough. And then here they got to try it again. And here's what these people did. And here's what they, what sectors of the game they went into. And here, and in the, the last cohort were these brand new folks who came in never tried Eve before in their life, as far as we know. Here's what they did in the game. This would be super interesting to uh, Omega clones, we'll call them. And those folks would, uh, if they if they got great detail and got hooked into the story of these people coming back, would embrace the feature even more. Yeah, CCP Quaint's yeah. presentation at next uh, fan fest is going to be ridiculous because you have all of that, but then he also can like brag about how much, uh, how many assets got unlocked because last year they talked, they, they were finally showcased how much assets were everywhere in Eve, everywhere, including inactive accounts. And they said, this is how many, it was like three times the amount was in inactive accounts as active accounts. And technically all of that becomes theoretically liberated as of November. Um, and so you, you know that he's going to showcase kind of that number again, but also the increase in production, the increase in T1, all of the stuff that gets used by Alpha Clones, the, the uptick in T1 fra uh, faction equipment, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, that presentation is going to be great. Hey, yeah, I'm sorry. Hey. I'm laughing at that, that image that Jared just linked is hilarious, just with the king from Braveheart. SRP costs money. Send in the Alphas. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Send the alpha shield in. Um, you, you know, I think that the other thing that that what this may lead to, well, I think, I think what it'll probably lead to, right, is is they're pulling kind of the rug out from under people being able to look at the uh, the PCU for concurrent users, uh, <laughs> because that is going to take on almost a meaningless comparison, uh, I think, in the not too distant future. All right. Uh well, okay, so let's go ahead. Let's move. I want to move. Do you have something else to say on this? Or? Well, yeah, the only thing I want, uh, I want to sort of finish off on that subject was um, this is going to give like a big opportunity for old players and new players to come back and sort of say hi and without any massive commitment. Um, so the next challenge that this opens up for CCP because they've removed the barrier, the pay barrier, will be what are they going to do in the new player experience that makes them go, hey, I'm committed enough to stay around long enough to work out the game mechanics and then start getting involved with the player corporations? 
because we I'll all be know home. getting there helps. It took me a year to get to like this game, to be honest. <laughs> I, 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 I have a lot of, to write about what I, I think still don't the like future it. of Highsec is. Um, mm. But one of the things that I think is going to be true is with the freedom of the 21 day trial, then what they consider the MPE, i.e. the amount that people get walked through, needs to greatly increase. The MPE should theoretically be your your entire alpha experience, basically. Like, so the PV, the MPE should fairly gradually get you through the basic tutorials and into whatever the new PVE content for these guys are going to be. If, so, if I, could get some I think feedback it's all together. On that, I think uh, most people would be surprised. You know who is cornerstoning, or rather, leading the charge on that? Zenaria. Zenaria has been the CSM that is just like all about trying to revamp the NPE. And I mean, I'll give, I'll give him a lot of credit. I don't think anyone, I mean, we all care, but he has been spearheading that, that we need to revamp that. And he's not going for his CSM reform like he used to. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, no, I mean, he's got a couple agendas. Yeah. I, I, mean, I like, voted him in on his reform platform. What's he doing on NPE? Uh, what's he doing on MP? Yeah, no, but I mean, like, I just want to give a little shout out because I mean, he's been a hot topic for people as to like, what is he actually doing? And, but I mean, we've all been commenting on that and NPE is definitely a hot topic that'll be coming up, especially when this, when these get finalized for the alphas. I mean, we so, all agree that we need, I mean, when you, when this influx of alpha or new players comes in, there's going to need to be some guides for them to explain how they're going to actually play. Because I think most people agree that the MPE, what they've done so far, yeah, they've improved it. It still sucks compared to most games. It's terrible trying to get people to actually understand fitting, for example. It's terrible trying to explain to them that, like, having a triple tank is a terrible idea. It won't work. But they'll do it anyways. I think the so, best people, mm -hmm. if I could just talk about MP real quick, I think the best people to teach uh, other EVE players how how to do things in a uh, game when they're just first starting off are other players. And, and like we've seen metrics from this before, like uh, the trial accounts who have never joined the player corp, they have like almost a zero retention rate. Like oh, they yeah. don't stick with the game. But if you're lucky enough to find a, a good group of people that'll sort of be your mentors or show you the way a little bit or just walk you down a path to, to get you interested. Here's a Rifter Fit that costs 500000 no, But Exactly, but the, the cool thing about the Alpha State now is you have more time to, to create those interactions, right? You're no longer limited by okay. time because 21 days of, of play time, let's say you start your 21-day trial, that's, that's three weekends, right? So if you're working or something like that or going to school, that's essentially six days you have. Yeah, to it's not game. enough time. It's right? totally so, not enough time. So now when you extend that to... An, quite a long time um you greatly increase the chance that you're going to run into somebody else in the game who's going to want to teach you um how to play the game and the cool thing is that when they did the frigate rebalance three or four years ago or whatever it sort of made it so that new players are an asset right that's something that you want to uh exploit right you need these new players they mm. provide tangible benefits for you so older groups like pls can have an incentive within the game, not a financial incentive, just an incentive in the game to teach other players how to join. This is when you saw like Karma Fleet come about, you saw Pandemic Horde come about. And um, it just, there are, and those are like the, just the big totally. things, right? And that, that's happened a lot on the smaller scale too. Like you want to recruit these newer players. These are a great asset for you. These are better than tech moons, right? If you can get a newer player to stay with you for, for a long time. Because if you look at how the, the, the game mechanics change, particularly with, um, you know, uh, Aegis Solve and things like that. You need bodies, you need people that are willing and, and able to go and do that sort of stuff. Us, us bit of vets, who, we, we just want to log in and go and shoot other capital ships and that's it. So you need that sort of, those that body of people that to energy. do those things. Yeah, the energy, because, yeah. it, and this is why I joined Brave when it was still at its peak, and, and actually it's had a resurgence in the last few months, um, was because the, just the sheer enthusiasm of it, it was like, oh, look at all these things that are going on, and everything was happening. And that's what drew me into it. And anything that helps create that momentum is is a big 
plus in my book as far as i'm concerned well that's what i was going to do is just segue through because we've talked about faction warfare probably getting a lift out of this we've talked about new players coming in and probably old players too and we d just dabbled in new player experience as well um uh, and i did want to get to how uh ceos are going to prepare for a possible influx of look you, you know people who are visiting tourists i call them you know the alpha clones that are people who are just kind of testing the game out tell me how that, they would i need to know yes well actually i was going to ask you and i was going to ask uh, <laughs> yeah i was going to ask uh, urziel too like because he's he's uh, urziel was preparing his videos to make sure they're updated because you know things have changed over the years and videos go out of date and i see that he's kind of preparing an educational you know, uh, material for an audience and stuff like that. Um, and Corneros, how are you going to prepare as a as a leader of a bi one of the bigger alliances? We used to be bigger. <laughs> 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 oh, our, they've scaled down recently. <laughs> we had we've had our our ass kicked and uh, somewhat shrunk. Uh, but uh, what I will say is, we, there's a fantastic wiki that we have access to. And we need to go back through and keep updating it. We actually do. Eve changes so much. You have to have a live wiki team at all times. Uh, and we're just, we, uh, we And a cool are, video. We need that. We need a cool video. Cool video. Uh, <laughs> we're also uh, uh, adjusting, uh, well, the Imperium is adjusting Karma Fleet. And we're going to make some changes to try to be welcoming and ready. Uh, what I don't, honestly, the Bastion, on average, I would say is a slightly older uh, average age than the rest of our coalition. We're a little, so we're, you know, we're going to be a great fit for old people who come and join under this. <laughs> so maybe you'll mark it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this question was raised by uh, Heart Torn there, uh, who said, uh, "How can a new player connect?" And so that's why I wanted to bring that up. Um, Urziel, you are redoing your videos. Yeah, I'm in the process of uh, recording new videos, and doing the new audio, and it's going to be time consuming. But hey, I got till November to get them done. There you go. Sure, you have some time now. How many people do you think this is really going to bring in? Everybody, like that's the magic question. But what's your intuition, you guys? Question. Does Does anybody have a guess? Well, what, my question that I ask people is, what do, What happens when Eve has a million people, a million more people? So you're optimistic about this. Well, I, I don't. He's I, always optimistic. I'm not. I mean, yes, I am always <laughs> optimistic. But at the same he's, time, he's a bard. He has to sing happy songs. Basically, exactly. every every <laughs> single time any game either it launches free to play or or changes over to free to play within a month they announce a million new accounts so i don't even know if this is optimistic that's just the nature of a free to play launch like we will get mm -hmm. a ton of people now the question is will that experience be stable will we hit a new level of harmony uh oh. or are we going like will it will it continue to swell up well, I, a bunch of people show up and tie dye all of high sec and it's completely terrible and everybody quits and it's a burnout or are we going to have you know more people who come and therefore they have a more they have a better experience than we had and then they enjoy it so they get more people and more people and it just kind of you know whatever I, I, well it should be said before you start tiberius this can only be measured in pcu right players that are concurrently on right. um, because the accounts they can't really say like, you can say how many paid accounts you have they won't say that but uh, we assume that everybody has been brought back to life and has the possibility to just turn on the game and get in. So really, you're only going to measure or see the increase in uh, population by either the analytics tool that's third party, or if you log into the game and you actually feel like there's more people flying around through gates and stuff like that. I'm sure if they can figure out a way to make the numbers look good, they will definitely have numbers like uh, unique logins per month where if you log in at least once during that month they count you mm -hmm. there's a player uh, test also how long is the queue to get into Jita <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> actually that's one of the things that I thought was really interesting that is a very good reason why these player built markets are kind of important because what happens when the trade hubs become literally overwhelmed and so 
it might be good to find a quieter place because it's a just as good as the old Jita was, and B doesn't have the nuisance of tie dye. And then the new world order would take over with Lenny Kravitz <laughs> encouraging people oh, you're, you're, you're to like move it. We also, also forgetting we got citadels now, so now it's like, well, cool. I'll just set up my citadel one jump outside, and now Someone you can all come help here. them. Yeah, and you can't you can't actually have your citadel in Jita, but, right? So but, you have yeah. to be around Jita. So yeah. if it's too uh, too packed to get in Jita, just go into one of the citadels nearby. Well, exactly. would it would it behoove people to start thinking, hmm, where do new players start? You know, why don't I hang out there and put up a market? And exactly. <laughs> I'm, but, I am actually uh, surprised that they're not keep stars anchoring in like every newbie place. They're not oh, keep stars. Yeah, because they're not allowed. Then the because allowed remember this. Are. This may not be new people. There are going to be a lot of old people that are that come back and kind of get rehydrated into uh, the older corporations that have been around a while. Like they'll be, oh, you're back. We got ten new members, but they're actually guys that left and unsubbed. Those will be like a big. I think a big. I don't actually think. I'm with Caleb. Caleb says one to two percent. It'll be a blip. It might be a bit pessimistic. Mm. Um, I think that it'll be less than a giant gold rush. Although I, I think that you guys have different opinions, right? I'm well, uh, I would or say actually at least had at least had the same. Go ahead. Ed. Yeah. So I I don't think it's going to be like a huge thing. I don't think we're going to go from uh, from fifty or from thirty thousand people to a hundred thousand people in December or something like that. But what I'm predicting, and, and as I said before, what I kind of hope happens is like thirty percent more people just show up, and and of that dynamic, who knows? Some of them are new, some of them are old, some of them stay at alphas, right? Like I I don't expect the alphas to can all convert into omegas at some point. I'm happy in an eve where there's 70% of the people are omegas and 30% are alpha and like the eve has only gone up by uh, 15,000 or 20,000 subs like people that are on during the weekend and stuff like that. If I log into eve and uh, there's 70,000 people or 65,000 people or something uh, this time next year, I'm going to take that as a huge huge victory and I'm going to be like this is a great thing for Eve to, uh, for Eve to experience. This, so mm. the thing that I, the, I want to clarify an assumption behind my optimism uh, and the reasons for that assumption. My assumption is that CCP's marketing engine is going to get super strong, especially around, you know, Vegas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I suspect that you're going to see it all over the place, you know, because it's going to be steam. It's going to be, it's already being written about and all that stuff because, uh, one of the things that's important is that CCP has been hiring some very, very strategic people when it comes to understanding, uh, the free to play kind of landscape and also marketing people and, and, you know, communication people, uh, the outreach uh, guys that they're making all of these mm. hires that they've made these big name hires that all of us have been talking about for like the last year none of them have really done anything which leads me to wonder what are they well, doing and i'm not saying that I'm, they're not I'm, doing anything i'm saying that I'm they are doing things i'm gonna skirt a nda slightly here but they are working on something i do know what they're working on but and it how is, do you know what? Oh, is this? Oh. You got you got good sources, man. You got to share. Listen, I do know that there's something's coming, and it is coming towards the end of this year when this is all about to come out. There is going to be a big marketing push. You just wait for it. Okay, you heard it here first. Yeah, <laughs> like everything right. else. And I can't, and I, and I'm going to say that because Manifest also said that it's going to come out in November. So. I was gonna. Oh, okay. I mean, I was gonna say. I mean, just. I We're think glad it's November, late over there, and you're drunk, by the way, Tiberius. <laughs> I, I was gonna say. I think in November, just with the amount of stuff like they're it. dropping, it's gonna be a very different Eve, like from November on, because of how much stuff that they're. I mean, with this, with the fleet boost, with everything, it's just like they're changing a lot. And I think it's interesting, like how deliberate CCP has been, not only in the last few months, but in the last like year or something, like. Skill injectors, I, I believe, like firmly paved the way for a change like this to happen to Eve. Totally. A change this drastic. And like I, I laugh as I remember a few months ago when they announced the Alliance tournament and they said it would be in late November or in like the middle of late November. I remember laughing being like, Oh, those guys, they they just sometimes don't look at a calendar, right? Like they put the finals for the Alliance tournament during uh Thanksgiving. <laughs> but like that was all intentional, like obviously not putting it through Thanksgiving, but having the Alliance tournament in November, like just even yeah. those like small little details, like 
this has been uh, in, in planning for so some time, and everything that we've seen has been incredibly deliberate. And I like to see, like, for the game that I've spent a decade of my life playing, I like to see like that level of uh, organization and, and that much thought put into introducing a change this drastic into a game. Well, I kind of thought that they might have thought uh, No Man's Sky might be a, more of a success than it was, uh, so that this might have coincided with let's the people that might go away to go do exploration in that game, we might try to win them back. Um, Urziel, you think there's going to be one... 10% or no, no, um, no, I actually wanted to throw it to nosy gamer who says it's going to be a wash after a year. So that means that all the people that come in will be gone by a year or at least the numbers will kind of fiz be the same. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly believe that, um, uh, it, 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 it's all going to depend on the new player experience and we have no, no past performance that says that they're going to improve the new player experience to the point where it's going to be this uh, allow this big massive wave of people to come in and uh, congregate that said if it's if we have the same level at the, you know this time next year as we do now that's they've they will have like stopped the decline so that's actually a positive the, so actually, let, you. Me, let me let me draw an analog analog for a moment at one point in the past, they added Plex and the ability to earn enough income in game to pay for your uh, account. And if we look back at what that did to subscription number, if I recall correctly, and hopefully I'm not breaking an NDA of any sort, I think it's roughly 30% it added on to the subscription base. So an additional 30% of players were subscribed because of that function. If we then use that as a little bit of a data point, I'm not saying it's a, a, a perfect uh, comparison. It's not apples to apples, but even apples to oranges is occasionally useful. Exactly. Uh, and as uh, I'm sorry, as... What, what was the function that added 30%? Plex. 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 Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah that's when you but, had the explosion in alts. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. That it, it fueled the ex explosion in alts, and so you had, you you weren't bringing new players in. You were actually having people have two, three, four accounts. Well, well, I, I don't think, know if that's I exactly alts, accurate, but... and I don't know if that exactly even matters, right? Like, because if the alts are faction warfare alts that uh, my faction warfare, for example, main interacts with. That's still a useful person, a useful addition, right? And I also know, like, uh, we, we can't really say that all those people were alts, right? Like, it, it's something that's uh, it was involved entirely on rhetoric, uh, I think. Here, here's another I know I played comparison. Eve. I played Eve okay. when Plex came out, sorry. Um, when Plex came out, it allowed me to play Eve longer, because at that time I was a pretty broke college student, but I was pretty good at tryharding Eve, right? So, so the reason I stuck with Eve is because I didn't have to pay... Uh, what, $200 a year, $150 a year, or anything like that. And here's, an, here's another comparison for a moment. Every MMO in the past has had its initial audience that came to it when it joined. And sometimes they tried to change it or expand it. I'm, I'm referring specifically, well, most famously to the Sony Online Entertainment Star Wars Galaxy. If you try to change that later, it's very, very, very hard to change who your audience is. You get who you get. The, same, the people who are playing EverQuest right now, some of them are the same folks that we got when we started that game, and it's very old and older than Eve. Uh, what I'm saying is it's not a problem if the people who come from from these alpha clones end up just being more of the same audience we already have. Uh, real quick, Carneros, I don't know if you said this earlier when you're introducing yourself, but how are you affiliate? How do you know so much about EverQuest? Oh, I'm the senior producer. Sorry. Okay, so we'll give you we'll give you some credibility. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, because we're out of time, but we're going to go a little over. No one after us. This is something I think Dirk wanted to tackle, right? Voting rights. Oh, yeah. I well, was actually going to address that, too. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, look, 
there there are a number of things that are associated with this with this whole clone states shift right? um you know some of them are in game a lot of people worried about gankers a lot of people were, and then some of them are outside of that this is one of those things that's outside of it right should they have you want them to have uh, or at least you know ccp says that they're going to have the ability to kind of participate in all these areas right should one of them be voting for our council of stellar management and you know and and I mean, I'm saying no, under no circumstance should you, because you'll be able to go out there and create these things. And there will be people who go out there and create all kinds of accounts to be able to stuff boxes. I think you could come up with a pretty good solution so that alpha clones uh, don't feel completely left out in the dark. Because obviously you don't want alpha clones to um, to just, you don't want like a candidate to make like 150 alpha clones or 100. 10,000 or whatever alpha clones and just vote for himself over and over again. But you can have it to be where if you were an Omega clone for two months of the last six months, then you know what? You can vote because it affects you, right? Like you don't have to say like only Omegas can do it. You can have some sort of time period, right? So you can say, oh, fewer. Because the way it is now, you have to be 30 days old or something to vote, right? So you have to be paying for the game for at least one month. I would argue that's how it works. I would argue that Alpha is similar. Sorry. I would argue that alphas should be able to vote because they deserve representation representation too. Like I was saying earlier, they have a totally different gameplay. And just in the same way that I don't necessarily expect a wormholer uh, or you know a, a CSM candidate from a wormhole to be able to represent my position that well, I'm not. I don't think any ill of him. I just don't think that he knows my perspective very well. And in the, that way, a CSM candidate may not know an alpha position very well. So alpha people might want to vote on that. There are yep. restrictions for how uh, old an account must be. And the other thing you got to remember is that this isn't some automated system that you're that you're just gaming over and then you get the isk and fade into the, the distance. You're literally being elected to be like one of the most visible people in the game. And so I, I think that like if one guy suddenly gets voted by like 80% alpha clones, it would be very quick and easy to detect like some pretty significant voter fraud. And there's no reason for CCP to do anything besides just totally destroy that person. I mean, uh, but what about being a landowner to vote? <laughs> that, that, I mean, that's that, the, that, that's that outdated, right? The thing about it is, like, I I was on the CSM for CSM six and CSM seven, and I think that the CSM is currently in a very delicate place, right? So you don't want to add any level of discredibility to an already like delicate balance. Like, I think. Yeah, this totally. year's CSM is already going like rebuilding a lot of the damage that previous CSMs have done. I don't want to like call call anyone's name up, but I think it would be silly if, for to not admit that the CSM has caused damage to itself in the past. Um, so it's it's really delicate right now. So I think it's important that you remove yeah. the ability to 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 say, oh, this is just some sort of dumb gimmick, right? The CSM is important. Like I firmly believe the CSM is important. As annoying as a body that they can be to I, both sides. Yeah, I mean, the, the CSM you know, is important. But they could use a few more votes, you know. Absolutely. Just... But at the end of the day, if I'm sitting here and say, like, I'm Hilmar, um, and I'm heading up CCP, and I'm, like, making decisions, saying, hey, here's this CSM. We're paying two members of staff to manage the CSM on a semi full time basis and then we're paying for these 14 people to come to Iceland twice a year is and Lord the benefit we're getting will from have that. to get pulled out of jail here's a here's yeah. a big question though here's a big it's question like, or here's how i would frame the question which solution causes a better answer or uh, you know, raises the least amount of extra questions. So if we but, say that everybody who's over four months old can vote, then that's simple. Everybody over four months old can vote. If only Omegas can vote, well then, can I plex the mo the month of the election and count? Can I, do I have to be Omega for four months? Why does that matter? I I dolphin and there there it becomes a more comp that's a more complex answer than just letting everybody vote. So in order for them not go with let's let everybody vote there has to be an incredibly compelling reason and given the fact that like we said earlier the dust voting system worked out okay i don't see that compelling reason 
the compelling, right, reason is, the compelling reason is that you want to talk to the uh, whales. You want the whales. You want the people that are paying the, the big money to have the greatest input into your game because you want to attract them and, and uh, you want to keep them. So you want to hear the voice of the whale more than the uh, voice of the person that's not paying any money at all. I don't know if that's necessarily it's true because no, the, the non-playing play, non alpha clone is contributing to my, if I want to consider myself a whale, my gameplay. Like, I am having a better time shooting them in the face because they're there to get shot in the face. Whales, by the way, are people who spend a lot of money in a game, as explained uh, on Grid, so you can, again, listen <laughs> yeah, to that I, podcast. I also I, want to counter that by saying that, like, like I said, it doesn't make any sense because it's not, the difference between the two isn't great. It's not... Uh, I don't know. It, never mind. I'm just going to back off for a bit and let somebody else talk. <laughs> Actually, mean, the only <laughs> CSM guy in here should probably talk, right? So <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing with alpha clones and voting is that you have to kind of uh, gauge a little bit. I mean, like you brought up the fact, like, what happens if they want to take their alpha clone and just plex it just for the election? Well, I mean, the thing is, you can already do that. You can already do that right now. That's nothing new, actually. I mean, if you really wanted, if you really wanted to make an army of voting alts, and you got the money that you just don't care, you can do it. You can just literally. But that's buy the barrier it. to entry, right? I mean, the, yes. the barrier yes. to entry to be able to pull off something like that would yes. w would that... cost you significantly in your wallet to get what to get your guy on the CSM of all places. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And so that's the thing is like, you know, you're saying what happens if somebody wants to convert their alpha just to vote? Well, if they want to do it, okay, then yeah, they spend the money and they can fine. do it. But um, the problem with allowing alphas to vote is just it opens up so many problem it's just such a massive problem that like some people are like what you think people are just going to make an army of alphas to vote well yeah i mean yes yeah, there they are a lot Somebody of people will that do. will do that exact thing they will it won't just... even be one person creating an army it'll be telling your member base like there, there are already coalitions and blocks out there who tell their members who they should vote for right doesn't mean that they're going to do it but a lot of the people actually do and if you then just tell them who to vote for and also just make two alts while you're doing it uh, then that completely it makes the the CSM pretty meaningless. You can fix that election. problem by saying that if that happens, though, then you get removed. Like I said, it's well, not but, like it's a prize that you can well, run home yeah, with. Well, but the problem with that then is how you how do you, all right? So you brought up the example of so someone got elected off of eighty uh, alpha votes, but which some of those votes were legit though, some of them were not though. But you have really no way of determining that, and that's one of the big issues. Is if they just I mean, I don't think they've officially stated. I'm just saying I would be very shocked if they actually did say, yes, we'll allow off this vote because of the amount of headache and problems it'll cause them. And at this point in time, as Elise kind of pointed out with the CSM, it is a little delicate. I will admit that this CSM is amazing. They have actually openly come out and told us that the CSM is one of the best ones they've worked with because we're not, there's very little bickering. And, you know, as he pointed out, they're trying to make sure that right now it's smooth and I mean, maybe at some point in time, I don't know, years down the road, they may decide, hey, we'll make one position on the CSM an alpha vote position. You know, something All like right. that. They could do that. But right now, I, I would be very surprised if they allowed it. Let me just uh, uh, ask Carneros, since, again, you have very specialized and very appropriate uh, experience about this whole topic, still working in gaming, running games like EverQuest, having worked for CCP in the marketing department, uh, if I may say, I don't know if this is okay to say, but it was around uh, the time the store opened. Um, and so, like, do you have any final thoughts on uh, this move? Because how do you rate it as far as significance for CCP? Absolutely, it's it's significant. This is a big deal. Um, it's it's going to be uh, partly based how successful it is is partly based on how well it's executed. And execution is not just technical in-game support and new player experience. It's also messaging. It's also, it's PR and marketing as well. And I don't, I don't know if folks are paying attention to that. The, I would agree. The really cool gal that took over my position when I left, uh, Lisa is her name, uh, director, I think she's, Senior Director or Vice President of Sales. Uh, she, um, today's her last day actually. She resigned today. She's gonna go uh, work in another place in the industry. 
I don't know if uh, she was just she left because she was excited about the new opportunity, which is pretty cool. Or I don't know if she left partly because uh, she didn't feel like she could be successful in the next phase of what's going on with her. I, I haven't had a chance to talk to her. Uh, we've played phone tag for the last three days. But just to re just to reemphasize that, so CCP's uh, marketing salesperson is has left. Yeah, she she's today was her last day. I don't know if they have anyone lined up yet. I, I expect no because it's not the kind of position that's super easy to replace. Well, how significant is that position to the strategy they're going? That would be a stakeholder in the process. So Can this you explain is, what uh, that means real quick? I've heard that term used a lot, but just... Stakeholder? Okay. Like a stakeholder in the process. So there's going to be a small group of people whose uh, job portfolio is is affected by the participation in this, in this uh, initiative. So that's going to include marketing, public relations, sales. Depending on how it's implemented, there may be... Uh, 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 CCP Seagull may be a stakeholder as well. I would assume so. And then, if there's going, if they expect a lot of customer support, they might bring in the the CS head. And those those people will each need to contribute input and manage a portion of the success of the project. They're all stakeholders. They're not just interested people. Who are going to be affected by it, but they're key people who are going to have to execute a part of the program. I hope to, I hope that PR and marketing are being deeply involved in what's going on, and not just told about it a, a short time ahead, like happened to the CSM, because there have in the past been technology-driven organizations that built something cool and then told their marketing and PR folks a short time before it happened. So the point is those guys have to be on board because this has to play to the public in the right way. And that's what we talked yes. about earlier. If it sounds like Eve is now cheap and a cheap game, then interest in it could wane. But if it sounds like, hey, it's a great game, it's still a premium game, but you can actually be a part of it for free, a small part of it, then exactly. the luxury feeling of playing Eve is, is like the investment you made in Eve is still there. It's still worth something. Yeah. You don't want to scare those people from making really deep new commitments to Eve. If you want to go deep in Eve, holy cow, this game will go deep. If that's how you you build your game, that's how you play an MMO, there's no game you can go deeper in than Eve Online. We don't want to scare those people. All right. It's you want to All give right. them every reason to find what they are passionate about. Mm. Well, you don't want to dilute it. And I think that's one of the, the triggers that's happening with people when their gut reaction is like, I don't like this, is because they feel like their investment's being diluted. Either it's now free for other people, or it doesn't matter anymore, or it's the end of times, or whatever Or they just you want. read the headline and didn't actually read any of the content. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of people did do that. And the reason oh, is they, they're, started on <laughs> there's definitely a reaction from people who invest in this game. Let's face it, playing for fun... It, Maybe some people do it, um, but really a lot of people like are they're invested in this game through their money, through their extra time like we are um, and through uh, the time that they choose to play it, you know, or just to be a part of it or to keep up with people who do or are a part of it. That's all stuff that they've made a decision. They like this game enough to keep investing in it emotionally and financially in another way. And anything that works against it makes that diluted like giving the next guy a much easier time than you had i think triggers a, a fairness thing that makes people you know riot on the streets that's why you see such a reaction on something that should be considered great because there'll be more people to shoot or more people to buy your stuff you know but with that after that soliloquy sorry about that let's just um see if anybody else has final thoughts on this whole thing i Hold on, let me pull up my notes. So the big, the big thing <laughs> that I have... No, I have two huge things for final thoughts. Uh, both are very relevant to this stuff. 
So uh, part of the On Grid podcast, uh, we got in, uh, in touch with CCP Siegel, and we are sending her a set of questions, and she's going to record answers to us, and we're going to put it together in a little thing, so that way you can listen to it. We'll yes. read the questions. She'll read answers. So obviously, there's still a ton of questions involved in all of this, and right now, until the end of the night, I am holding an hashtag EveF2P questions hashtag. So Eve free to play questions hashtag. Uh, if it's you, not free to play. <laughs> you know, I made the name. It, it has to be short. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty good hashtag, though. Let's be real. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyway, if you tweet with that hashtag, I'm going to assemble all of the questions together, add it to the ones that we've already built, uh, send them over to her, uh, and she will record the answers and we'll get them out to you as quickly as we possibly can. So that's cool. The other thing is for anybody who is available tomorrow at 2100, uh, Jintan is holding his PVE roundtable, uh, which <laughs> me and Jintan have been talking because it's like, like, oh, well, we didn't really know this was coming when we scheduled the PVE roundtable for that. And it's like, everything's now white noise com of, of what we were planning on talking about. But either way, good uh, luck. More than ever, it's important to deal with our PVE, so there's going to be a roundtable to get players' feedback for a lot of different stuff. Uh, those are the two big things. Uh, you covered the on-grid podcast earlier, so awesome. And Sullen, you had uh, something that was coming up too? Uh, yeah, I have uh, the industrial roundtable that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, I mean, I've pretty much got it solidified, but yeah, we're basically going to be talking with people for the vertical little bit of the orca but mainly kind of just getting concerns like a last minute thing i can as much as i can get before we leave for iceland next week can uh the round table is for anybody to join it uh well round table no is not for anybody to join but i mean you can message me on tweet fleet if you feel like you would like to join and i mean it I, there wasn't a forum post it's not like the town hall style where it's just like we're just going to have a, you know a ton of people just all talking but uh if you want to message me on tweet fleet uh just selling decimus on there same as my in-game name you're welcome to and it's not really like it's exclusive or anything just you need to let me know if you want to get in that's all really <laughs> Be advised, it's not about industry, it's about industrial capitals. Yes, that is, and that is a key thing. This is not a industrial roundtable. This is specifically around the Roracle because of the changes upcoming, because we're trying to kind of gather how people feel about it. Are they going to actually use them? What is What gameplay styles are going to be killed by the new... I mean, because the Roracles are the ones that are the most affected by the on-grid boosting for the most part. Mm. So it's... A, a very different thing with them. Just give it a shorter cycle time on the industrial core. So um, the coolest thing. Well, I mean, I... that's the thing. If you got, if you think that's the what it should be, I mean, it, all of this is on the table. I don't believe they've finalized any numbers. Uh, I had a discussion with Fozzie yesterday, just uh, talking about some of the upcoming ideas they have. But like I said, I mean, I don't think anything's finalized yet. They have an idea what they're going to do, but I mean, they are always open for suggestion. Which I want to reiterate again. With the fleet boosts, while I'm on that really quick, just leading into it, you know, people talk about the fleet boosts, and I know there's a lot of complaints about numbers on there. And Fozzie, I believe, even stated in that dev blog that when they release these things this far in advance, there's a reason. I mean, there's a reason they're giving us fleet boosting and that sort of thing this far in advance, because if you have compelling reasons for the numbers to change, please post them. Trust me, the CSM have posted it a lot. But it sounds a lot better when we say it, and then we have 200 more people on the forum saying, like, this should really be this, not what you have. I want to say the one thing I like about the Oracle change is that the, like, super weapon thing is, like, the whatever they actually call it. I forget what it is. Panic but button. If you look at the, yeah, it's, it's the literally oh shit panic. P-A-N-I-C. It's the oh yeah, shit it's button. my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Noisy, do you have any uh, final thoughts on, on the topic? The only thing I can say is that we're going to find out a lot more in the next two months, and E Vegas is going to be wild. Are you going to be there? Mm. I'll be there. E Vegas is going to be great. Absolutely. Come. Mickey, I actually, be there too. actually, of everybody that I met there, I was hanging out with Noisy, Noisy Gamer the whole time. <laughs> no. Well, him and Fi, Fi Ridian, I think. But uh, that's who I spent most of my time with. Uh, uh, great guys. If you meet them there, it's a. Uh, uh, there's a real treat. Uh, Urziel, you have anything else? No. Uh, are, you, are you still awake? <laughs> yeah, I'm still awake. Um, I might Give my try second and, win. I might try <laughs> and prod uh, Solon for an invite to that uh, 
yeah, please sell do. in. Hook him up. Yeah, yeah, no, you're well, completely welcome. It'll be in 1900 tomorrow. I'm, I'm which is two hours before the, too. which is two hours before the PVE thing. So you'll be able to make it to both if you really want to sit through four hours of nerds talking. <laughs> You Sorry, forget what done, I do for we've, a living. We've, <laughs> I know. We've done two and a half hours in this The joke now. was inside there because I know what we've all been doing all day. Yeah, <laughs> right. Two hours here. All right, guys. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Elise, thanks for coming. Uh, I know you ran ran home from work and stuff. Tiberius, thanks for staying up till five in the morning again. Always full of great stuff. I'm glad your judgment failed you and you told us you had an inside <laughs> uh, <laughs> scoop on something. I'm sure it was legitimate. Wow. Oh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank everybody for uh, staying up with us and spending your Friday night. Have a great weekend. In the U.S., it's a holiday weekend, so have a great extra day. And uh, we will see you next time uh, on the show. Thanks, everybody. Have Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.